I'm Jack. And I'm Brendan. And we're coming to you from beyond the terrarium. Where DIY meets naturalistic breath talking. Enjoy. All right, everybody. Welcome back to episode number five of Beyond the Terrarium. I am uh, joined by my lovely co-host, Brendan Meyer, at the right corner. How are we doing, Brendan? Oh, man. Living the dream like always. You know how it goes. <laughs> we still, uh, we need an update on the cat gecko eggs, man. We're we're in week, what, six of those? Dude, they are, they are right here, and they are looking phenomenal still. We're a month in today, actually. So Awesome. They're looking solid, man. They're plump. They're, they're doing good, so... That's awesome. Fingers crossed. We gotta, we gotta have like a live hatching video or something of them. You probably cry during it. Are oh, you gonna see me? You wanna see me cry on camera? <laughs> Is that what you want? Yeah, that will get the viewers, man. That's what we need. She's uh she's looking she's looking plump again too, man. I'm hoping she drops another clutch soon. That'd be awesome. So that would be we'll see. That'd be sick. Be sick. Yeah, well, man, we so uh, we had an episode a couple of weeks ago about Kevin. We talked about like kind of what I was doing with him and the plans uh for for kevin my cayman and uh just quick update for all the people he has completely destroyed everything i've done uh there's plants in the water there's dirt in the water it's it's a mess out there so he's uh he's in timeout right now but got to get that fixed um that was a real i walked down there the other day i was like you've got to be kidding me man this is dude that cool. video the video you sent in the group chat of him is like a dog just kicking the dirt yeah. in the water. Yeah. I was like, oh my god, yeah. man. Yeah, I need to post that on the, the page, but it's 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 a terrible video of him just wrecking everything I did. So <sighs> yeah, not happy with him, but you know life, man. Yeah, yeah. So without uh any further ado, I think we should go ahead and get right into it. Um, we've got a very special guest today. It's our uh, our second guest episode, and we're super stoked on it. Um, so we've got Eddie from Father Blue down here joining us. Um, Blue Tree Monitors, I think that's the the page now, right? Eddie is Blue Tree Monitors, or that's pretty much it, man. That's yeah. I'm uh like you guys said, I'm Eddie, uh based out of New York City, and uh, I run the page uh, Father Blue on Instagram and Facebook and YouTube, which is a uh, Instagram that or a, a social media dedicated to my work with the Blue Tree Monitors. It's the only species that I work with uh, currently, uh, like seriously. And yeah, I just, I love, I love them. I got a passion for them that's deeply rooted and I love to share everything about them to people, you know? Yeah. And that passion is very evident if you go to your Instagram. I mean, you're doing <laughs> just about everything you can be. I think if anyone, um, is going to see something like that in the wild, especially like where you have to go to see them. Oh, like yeah. that, that's, that is a trek that, that is, that shows the passion for sure. So, Appreciate so are you like in New York city? Like I'm trying to get an understanding of where you're at, man, because yeah, I, man. Well, um, I'm, I'm Brooklyn. I'm in Brooklyn. So okay. Brooklyn is part of, of uh, New York city. Yeah. Um, and I guess the best place to, I'm like, like a 10 minute bike ride to downtown Brooklyn. So like wow. I'm like 10 minutes wow. from the Manhattan, from the uh, Brooklyn and the Manhattan bridge. Wow. Not even that far to Manhattan. So yeah. Crazy that I have all this stuff here. This yeah. Season, you know, like you normally wouldn't see that stuff, but yeah, I've had to figure out how to do it. I love this so much and I had to figure it out, you know? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. No, it's, it's very impressive. Like just that fact in itself makes it much more impressive. My sister lives in New York city and I can't imagine her having anything other than like, barely a bed in her apartment so <laughs> <laughs> that's so, a problem out here dude it really yeah. is but no I, ha I had people over here last year for a tree monitor fest when i threw that and like in in the summertime and they got to see it like a lot of people they see the room on instagram and but when they see it in person it's it's a really large space you know and i got i got yeah. really lucky so and the the reptile room is separate from like my living situation upstairs so it, it was a it works out really nice man honestly i'm blessed to have this opportunity to do this here yeah, yeah, absolutely. It's it, it's awesome. I mean, I, you're probably the only person in New York City keeping blue tree monitors. Maybe not. <laughs> uh, yeah, right. I I wish I could find more. I hope if anyone yeah. sees this and you do, let's link up, dude. Let's grab a beer yeah. or something, man. Because I want to geek out with other people, but I don't have that right now. Yeah, 
Absolutely. I'm sure the, the reptile community in, in uh, New York City is probably pretty small generally. Yeah, yeah. There is there like any restrictions there that you have to deal with? Like oh yes, yeah. man. Everything's illegal here. Everything's <laughs> illegal here. Yeah, pretty much, man. Like there's there's almost nothing that you can keep here other than like certain turtles, certain lizards, certain things like that. Like technically this isn't even really appropriate, but because I'm on the landmass of Brooklyn, you know, it's a it's a little bit different than being in the yeah. city. Gotcha. You know, gotcha. but it's still like if somebody I, I don't know what will happen if somebody did try to do anything. I've had people in, come into my house for inspections and things like that for the animals and stuff, and it's never been a problem. Yeah. Know, so well, right I'm now, sure if they saw your stuff, they'd be like, it's been good. Yeah. Yeah. They see this shit. and they're like, this guy's legit. Like, yeah. well, let's not mess with that. <laughs> yeah. 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 You're not you're not keeping blue trees and, and totes in your basement. Yeah. You know, like a yeah. legit setup, you can tell. Yeah. Yeah, or an Asian water monitor in your bathroom or whatever. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> or, yeah. yeah or, a croc or an alligator. You guys yeah. hear about that? Like they found an alligator in uh, Prospect Park over here in Brooklyn? Yeah. Okay, yeah. <laughs> I was reading something today. It might be the same one. I don't know if it's the same one, that, but they, they confiscated one from a guy who had a permit for it. For oh, like, that's that's different. He's that's upstate. upstate. Okay. That guy's gotcha. upstate New York. Yeah, He's yeah. Upstate, I saw that yeah. there too, yeah. That was crazy. He had like a whole indoor pool built. Like he said, he spent 120 grand on it. Wow. Dude, crazy. Yeah, the stuff that's in New York, man, is is wild. And and the reason why a lot of this stuff is illegal is because of the is stuff like that. Like mm -hmm. I think what really pushed this. I don't know if you guys ever heard of this story, but pretty much like I want to say like 10, 10 years ago, a guy got caught in Harlem in Manhattan, and he had a full grown tiger in his apartment. Oh my god. <laughs> yeah, he had a full grown tiger in his apartment. And the only reason they found it was because he had gotten mauled by the tiger trying to feed it. And he went oh, to the yeah. doctor and he was like, yo, guy, I got bit by my dog. Can you help me out? And the doctor's like, bro, this ain't no dog bite. And yeah. they went to investigate it and they found a full grown tiger in his house and an alligator in his bathroom. Wow. And that yeah, that led to a lot of like, dude, we can't have these animals here. Yeah. Yeah. But if you look up Absolutely. if you look up tiger in Harlem in on Google, you'll find the story. It's crazy. They got the tiger. Trying to bite out the window in the apartment, the police officers hanging Jesus out the Christ. out the rope out the window oh like it's crazy, god. man. <laughs> oh my god, <laughs> that's that's crazy. Yeah, we have we have like the I don't want to say the exact opposite pro. We have the exact opposite situation here. So I'm in South Carolina. We have oh, like no you. laws or anything, man. Like it's Damn. it is the wild west out here for sure. Like yeah. you go to a, a, a reptile show down here, and it you could buy. <laughs> A gaboon viper for 60 bucks or whatever, oh, you know. Dude, that's a life right there. I wish I was well, like, man. Yeah, I'm like right in the middle of you guys, man. Like we can't have native or venomous, but we can pretty much have whatever else in Illinois, which is surprising yeah. being Illinois. You know how Illinois is, but yeah. As long as you're native or venomous or rear fangs, you're pretty much good to go for the most part. Yeah. That's lucky, man. I wish. Yeah. One day, one day one we'll day. see. <laughs> <laughs> Awesome. Well, um, I think to start out here, um, just kind of want to get an idea of like why blue tree monitors. I know this has been a, an ongoing thing for you. You've had blue tree monitors for a while, but like, why did you initially set on them? And like, what's your group look like currently? Yeah, yeah, for sure. I love that. I love that question, man. I, I have been keeping monitors since I was like, I'm first of all, I'm 31 now. And I've been keeping them since I was like 16. I've been keeping monitors. Uh, I started off like Savannah monitors for a really long time. And then I worked my way up when I moved to New York, finally from, I'm originally from Washington, DC. Okay. When I moved to, when I moved to New York, uh, I, I, I wanted to get back into lizards and I got into uh, Tristis or blackheaded monitors. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And th those are really cool. I had like a group of six of them. They were beautiful animals and they were an arboreal species. And I was like, these are really cool, small, kind of like easy to manage monitor it's arboreal it's really core cool. semi-arboreal it's cool um and so i had this beautiful group and i was like okay what's the next thing from here what can i do that's different from these guys and i knew about tree monitors for a long time from back in the day it used to be on like the i don't know if you guys know about these forums but the repti zone forums oh yeah it used yeah, to be yeah. back in the day i used to that's i used to be on those forums yeah i used to be on those forums all day and i remember one day someone posted like the famous photo it's out now. It's an old photo of, of a guy holding tree monitors in his hand. And he has like a row of like five tree monitors in one hand. He has a row of all the colors in one hand. Mm -hmm. And that was my first introduction to tree monitors. I was like, wow, I can't believe that. I, can't be I couldn't believe that animals came in this color and stuff. 
And so I started doing some research and everything said that tree monitors are hard to find. Tree monitors are easy to kill. They are full of parasites. They're very hard to work with. And that just intrigued me. So it was my birthday. I want to say like 2019. It was my birthday, like a couple of months before my birthday. And I found a dealer for the first time I ever seen them for sale on like Fauna Classified. And I got a pair for like 1500 bucks, a male and female. And I got them shipped and it got delivered on my birthday. And that after that, I just fell in love with them. I was just like, wow, dude, I can't believe that these things are a fucking a, an animal. I can't believe I, I have these rare animals. I never seen them for sale before. And now I have a pair. Um, and, I, and then I got went through the rabbit hole, like joined all the Facebook groups for tree monitors, asking all the questions. How big of an enclosure do I build? How do I do this and this? And my first ever enclosure that I built for these animals was a, a seven foot wide, seven foot tall, two foot deep enclosure with the with a with a whole fake background with my first time doing the fake background and and all this about trying to be bioactive for the first time and just the process of all that because i had never done it i always like the uh, granted i did it with the with the tristis but i never done it with, with like a tropical species so mm -hmm. i was like wow and i can keep plants here and they can live and i can do the water and all this. and that was just so much fun and the community for that be, it was already like growing but it was still small and it was really cool and after I had those two, I just got the bug. Every time I saw a blue tree monitor for sale, I was like, you know what? I'm going to get it. They're so rare. I haven't seen them. I'm going to buy it. And that year, man, I just, I grew from like two tree monitors. Not that year, like a year later, I grew from two, two tree monitors to, I want to say like eight or nine tree monitors. And now I'm at, now, now I'm back at like nine, nine of them. But through the year I've moved, I've gotten some, traded some, you know, things like some go and everything like that here. And I, I've had many blue tree monitors in this facility not in my groups but now i'm at nine total for those guys yeah but i just love them man there's just everything about them learning about them seeing them a rare color like that blue like my favorite color also is blue uh but but seeing a rare color like this an animal that's like it's 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 the larger size of the uh, it, the prasinus complex you know so it's it that really drew me to it too so it's a little bit more of a heftier animal and you know, the, the, the aspect of their arboreal, which is very interesting. There's so many qualities of these animals that really made me love them so much, you know. And as I started diving and learning about them, it the, the rabbit hole just got deeper, man, honestly. <laughs> as it normally does. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so what's your what's your current group look like now? Like how many how many like males, females you got going? I, I've seen you so, post some eggs and stuff recently. Yeah, yeah. So I have four females, four males. No, four females, five males. Because I just picked up. I just got one today from uh, Brian Susan. Shout out Sundown yeah. Reptiles yeah. CP. So I just got a, a, a new uh, juvenile male from him. Uh, so yeah, I have, I have five males, four females, uh, and the plan is by the end of the year to add another four females and maybe one more male. That's the plan. Wow. Nice. Yeah, nice. Is that just in your current cages? Are you building more or? I will build more. Like I have a whole nother wall to this room that I'll add more cages and everything. And I still have an entire garage that isn't even touched yet. You know, wow. so wow. <laughs> yeah, I got like a, I'm lucky wow. for the space. But yeah, I'm I'm trying to really dedicate and hone this like this particular species. Not because like I'm not looking for like any accolades or anything like that, but it's more so to like understand them, be able to share this knowledge with people really work on a, a sustainable captive program like mm. and I, maybe i'll talk about this more later into the into the show about like what my projects are with these animals right um and yeah man because i i mean i've been out there i've seen what's happening to them i don't know how long this is going to last so we're going to have them here in captivity you know yeah and yeah. especially with the with the, the scares looming around as well what's what's going to happen in the future potentially like yeah. i just really want to focus on these animals and i'm in no I may know like ants to like get a another species at the moment. You know? Yeah. 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 And you're saying the accolades thing. I don't think you could put as much work as you have into it and, and be about the accolades, man. Like you, yeah. <laughs> it's so much work. Like it would not be worth it if you're just trying to, yeah. you know, get people to like you or whatever. So it's, it's very impressive. So we can see, you know, the show stopping enclosures that you've got behind you, which we'll get into for sure. But you were talking about the seven foot by seven foot enclosure you first built. Yeah. Can you yeah, kind yeah. Of walk us through like what that build was and the materials and stuff like that and what you liked from it and what you didn't like from it. Yeah. Yeah. That, that was the catalyst to 
everything that I had here, uh, were, like the bioactive and the more natural range, because it was it wasn't the first time trying it, but it was my first time trying it for a tropical species. And I went through Instagram and I went through Facebook and these reptile groups asking, like, what's the proper size for these animals? And at the time, a lot of people were saying four by four by two people. Mm -hmm. But that was the U.S. was saying four by four by two was a standard uh, and then the European guys were like, nah, dude, we keep these in giant, massive walk-in enclosures and you got to do it this way. And so I was still renting at the time. I had roommates, but I had like another, I had to live the, in a basement situation that was my own. So I wanted to max out as much of the space as I could. So I, I fell on seven foot wide, seven foot tall, two foot deep at the time. And it, I, I had like, did the whole like, uh, waterproof the inside with dry lock. I, uh, I had like hanging lamps in there as well to give different gradients. Um, I hadn't done the, like, I don't know if you guys seen where I do like the, the, the lower, uh, floor lighting. I hadn't done that yet. I hadn't practiced that yet, but I had just hanging lamps to get different gradients. So one's higher, one's lower. Um, I had done a fake background with foam. And at that time I did the foam and then you carve it and you put silicone and then you put cocoa earth on it and everything like that. Mm -hmm. um, and I put a bunch of plants inside of there as well to try to get them to grow and establish. Um, and I learned a lot from that enclosure. I learned that that method sucks for tree monitors, first off, because because they rip it off the wall easily. Um, yeah. I, I I didn't I didn't uh, seal the bottom of the enclosure well enough. So when I moved it, the whole bottom was rotted out and everything like that. Water was everywhere. There was no drainage layer or anything like that. So every time I sprayed it and I was spraying heavy. The water would seep out, and that was a whole mess and everything like that. Uh, I had built it that time. I did, I was too broke because I'd spent all my money on the tree monitors, right, at the time that I had to build the sides. Instead of glass, I used uh, vinyl. It was, like, clear vinyl. So it's, like, the mm -hmm. same thing they use to, like, to like insulate chicken coops and stuff like that. Oh, I yeah. Used yeah, yeah. The, you know, like, clear plastic vinyl that you stretched out. And that's what I use for my like side panels and my windows and everything like that. And that worked out well, but uh, that was, I was, you know, I, I didn't have a lot of money back then while I was doing that. And um, so I learned a lot from those. I, 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 my next enclosures, I learned how to combat the draining situation by lifting up my cages, adding drains to the cages. Uh, I, I, I made them bigger, deeper, instead of two feet, I went out to three feet. Uh, I started experimenting with the, the lamp dome that I go down to the floor so I can heat up the floor to keep the, inf the, the temperatures more stable around the enclosure and not have a really cold enclosure. So, yeah, it was it was cool. It was and I got a lot of feedback from a lot of people because a lot of other people at the time were in the U.S. at least weren't doing these large scale enclosures for these tree monitors. And they were pretty content with the, the small cages. No, no, nothing bad about that. But I just want to do it differently. You know, and like now we're at yeah. these. Now we're at these where like. They're not perfect, but they work for what I'm doing, you know? Mm -hmm. I feel like, too, it seems to be a trend, not so much now. It, I think it's changing these days, but the U.S. seems to be behind the European guys in terms of, like, Most size definitely. enclosures and the, the, the type of care, I guess, that they give. They just seem, at least in the past, they were, like, leagues ahead of everybody over here. You know, everybody here wanted to do the – the bare minimum to fit as many animals as possible in a room. And those guys over there, man, they had one or two animals, but they were decked out, massive enclosures, you know. Yeah. And I'm glad yeah. to finally see people in the U.S. kind of jump on that train and and get on the, the less animals, better enclosures, rather than more animals, shittier enclosures, you know. Yeah, yeah. And I, I love that, too. Like I said, a lot of my inspiration came from those guys in Europe at the start of it. Like even Even the guys, when I was first building my enclosures, and I'm still friends with them, were from like mm -hmm. Germany, you know, they were like, no, dude, go this size. And stuff. because originally I was going to build the closures like I think 18 inches because I didn't even know like 18 inches deep. Right. And I was like, oh, that's enough. And these guys were like, no, man, we give our tree monitors bigger enclosures, go minimum two feet. And I was like, OK, I'll do that. You know, and then that led to like, no, nah, they got they give whole rooms. Let's go three feet. And, you know, yeah. it's from it's from the inspiration that those guys do. And then, like you said, whatever it is that they're they, they just have this mentality that, like, you know, animals are here. I, I, I think the difference is, like, yes, yeah, some of those people breed for profit, but a lot of those people just breed or keep animals because they just love the animal. You know, they yeah, just want to learn true. about the animal, explore the animal, share with their friends. And unfortunately, here in the USA, 
you know, we've had a lot of influence in the reptile culture where it's about like money, money, money. And yeah. I think that's what's caused that small enclosure size. But now it's changing. And yeah. I got people, I got OGs who I've, I would never have thought in a million years come to my house, see my stuff. And, they, and then they show me pictures of massive enclosures for tree monitors that they're building. And I'm like, dude, I'm just like, I love to see yeah. it, bro. I love to see that even you guys are seeing this and like, yeah, we, it's time to change, you know, and yeah. that, that's amazing, you know? Yeah. Yeah. And like you said too, it's not like it's, it's necessarily bad the way that they're doing it. It's just not like they're, that you can always do better and like make yeah. an effort to do better. It's funny that I have a book. I can't remember what the name of it is, but it's about like naturalistic enclosure design or whatever, and, or just enclosure design and housing reptiles. And um, it describes like the two, types of housing is like euro style and american style and the american style in the book is literally like tubs man it's so funny <laughs> it's so funny yeah. how they describe it like that but yeah man it's just yeah. what it is unfortunately it's just a history like I, i've had yeah. some people talk to me about certain situations where they've seen animals that are in tubs that shouldn't be in tubs you know because that's just the mentality that they have when you when I talk to my European friends, they're like, you know, how are the tub keepers in America? And I'm like, yeah. <laughs> we got that, we got that, that stigma, but we're changing that, you know, which yeah. is good. Yeah, absolutely. And that's kind of the goal of our, our podcast too, is just to, to show people like what other people are doing and, and talk about it and get ideas for ourselves on how we can kind of improve that um, and, and just experiment more. Cause that's what they're doing over there is they're just trying yeah. stuff, you know, like, I'm sure none of them who did it or started it knew exactly what they were doing. They were just figuring it out and trying it. And they were like, this is how this animal they thought should be kept. And that's where, how they went with it. So, yeah, yeah. That's how you learn, man. That's how we all grow together. You know, like I love uh, the last, uh, the last um, guest you guys on, had on in Hills for Scales. Like he, what he does with his man, with yeah. his mangrove monitors, or I love the build out for his enclosures. I saw when he was building it out, it's just yeah. beautiful what he's doing with those animals, you know. And I, I love to see the progression of more keepers like that, innovating, creating new ways, different ways from this old mentality of keeping these animals and being successful, man. It's, it's just, yeah. Yeah. I can't wait to see the future guests. You have on here they're gonna blow my mind about yeah. how we're doing stuff you know <laughs> yeah absolutely man that's the goal is just to to learn more and see more of that stuff that's awesome so one thing i want to go back to um you were talking about those the lower heat lights that you added yeah, 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 yeah. warm up the bottom of the enclosure was that something that you just you you noticed that the the bottom was too cold or were you actually thinking that they would be basking down there or kind of what was your idea when you started doing those well, yeah. So what it was, was when I, when my first time ever lifting up the enclosures, I lifted up the enclosures because I wanted to drain the water, right? Mm -hmm. I, I noticed that the bottom of the cage was just stay like a swampy mess mm -hmm. and, and a soupy mess. And I wanted to like remove the water. All right, cool. So I solved that by, by elevating it. Well, mm -hmm. what I noticed is because I'm in New York city and the winters are pretty cold here in the city. Yeah. Um, no matter what I do, I noticed that the tree monitors will always stay up top. They never travel to the bottom. And everyone, and, and that was one of the big reasons why everyone was like, if you do tall enclosures, it's a waste of space because the tree monitors don't use the bottom. They only use the top. They only stay near the basking area. Yeah. And I was like, this got, there's got to be something to that, right? And so I will temp gun the bottom enclosure. And lo and behold, I'm getting temperatures in like the 60s, you know, when up top, I'm getting temperatures in the 80s, 90s, you know, I'm like, well, this is probably why the tree monitors aren't going to the bottom. It's too cold. There's no light. Nothing's yeah. growing down here, right? And so the first time I did it was I lifted the cages up. I still hadn't done drainage layers. I just had drains. And uh, it changed significantly once I added a drainage layer. But I had the, I had the drains. And then I, I hung an extension cord. I, I, I put the, the lamp directly to the extension cord. And I, hung, and I hung it so it was free moving. But it was protected away from the animals. And that gave a new basking spot to the bottom of the enclosure. Immediately, like literally within the, that same like next two days, I see my animals going to the bottom. The male's trying to chase the female. The male is basking down there. The, the male is eating food down there. Wow. All these types of like behavioral differences I saw like immediately. And the temperatures were more stable. It was uh, 100 degrees in the middle of the spot. Outside of the, outside of the ring, it was like 75-ish in that area now it was a more comfortable zone uh mm -hmm. and that so so that led me to be like okay well in my particular situation in a place where it is predominantly cold most of the time 
maybe mm-hmm. it's a good idea to add that third lamp, which I can dim and I can change the intensity as much as I want, depending on what time of the year it is, to give that extra heat down there. So now I just do it as a as a every single enclosure, no matter what I build, even if it's four foot high, three foot high. There's no way if you got a four foot high enclosure and you got your lamp all the way at the top, is that bottom layer getting hot? Now I do that to do just to just cycle it. And 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 it's not like I keep it at a, a certain range. I every cage gets dialed in specifically for that cage to make sure that that range is with where it needs to be. You know. Gosh, do you uh do you heat your room or is it just whatever your house no. is? Yeah, that's where my house is, and and, gotcha. and uh, my my partner likes it for, likes it fucking cold. So <laughs> <laughs> that makes sense then too with the with the lamps. Then if you if you don't have a heated room, man, it, it makes a lot of sense to keep. Yeah, keep yeah, I'm sure if you have if you have a heated room, sure you probably won't need this, right? It just depends on the situation. Like if you're in California, you probably don't need to heat, heat the bottom of your enclosure because your your ambient dirt's probably already like 75 degrees. Yeah, but in my case, right. in this in the winter time. You know, it's like 35 outside. I'm in the basement, in the garage, and everything like this. My dirt mm-hmm. isn't, so I need I need to add that extra heat to heat it. And immediately, I see my animals utilize every single one of my enclosures. I see I have one male who forages. I have, like these these setups are completely alive. Like I have night yeah. crawlers. I have I have isopods. I have millipedes. All types of animals in here. I have one male that forages. He'll dig into the dirt, pull out an earthworm, mm-hmm. eat it. And things like that. Like I have, I have, I have them basking at the bottom. Like I see these behaviors mm-hmm. that I've never seen anybody else talk about because they don't try it, right? And yeah. I'll just say, what happens if we all tried it? You know, what would, yeah. what, maybe you can keep them in larger enclosures, and they will use it if you just mm-hmm. try to do it. You know? Yeah, yeah, that's amazing, and that's something I think we we like to talk about too. Is like the significant behaviors that you're trying to get out of your animal, and how you can accommodate that through enclosure design. Yeah. Um, and it's like something like that you would have never seen. And, it, you know, like you were saying with with other people saying that they never go down to the bottom. If you just accept that and you don't do anything differently, then you're never going to get that, you know, different behavior out of them. And probably like that from the way you're saying it, it sounds like a cooler behavior than them just being up at the top. You know, if they're digging yeah, around. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, man, they're they're cool. They're digging around. They're foraging. I put the leaf litter in there and everything like that now. So I give them all these new environmental stimuli that they investigate they go and look they're like what is this stuff what is this new plant what is this new smell what is this new bug like can i eat it you know like i see mm-hmm. this stuff and they'll you know sometimes i'll get a random bug that comes in from a branch and they'll bite it and oh, i don't like that throw it away i've seen this you know like but this is stuff that you wouldn't see if you're like oh i can't put in outside logs because i can't fit in my oven because i can't bake it and i can't do this and i can't use like but no, I just I like to experiment. I like to see what happens, figure it out as long as it's safe and isn't harmful. I'll try it mm-hmm. and then we'll go from there and adjust as I need to as I, as I go along, you know. Yeah. Speaking of those logs, man, this is a side comment or side question, <laughs> but like how do you where do you get sticks and stuff from in the city? I'm sure we've got a lot of oh. people who Oh, keep, go going, keep going. Okay. Keep going. I'm sure we got a lot of people listening who are like in a city and stuff and can't go necessarily like looking for them, but like where do you get your logs and stuff. I get I get so lucky here man. I, everyone asks me that and I'm like if I can get logs man yeah. you got to be able to get them right? Like yeah. like I I my my lucky gold mine was when I first moved into this building like literally the week that I lived I moved here uh, they they had chopped down a giant oak tree like a humongous yeah. oak tree. They had cut it down and so that that week I'm moving in as I'm moving in my stuff I'm taking a whole, I took a, the whole tree I brought it home pretty much, yeah. you know? And and then like in, in here in New York, whenever it gets super windy, just big old logs just fall yeah. down, you know? Yeah. And I collect them. I don't care how crazy I look. I'll strap it on. I don't know if you saw my Instagram the other, like the other week. That's I'll I was strap it right onto, yeah, I strap it onto my bike, ride it home. I'll chop it up when I'm at home. Or, or if I don't want to look crazy, I'll go at night, chop it up. And then I'll go <laughs> one by one like that, you know? But yeah, dude, I just... I go to the nearest parks and like, luckily I live in a neighborhood where there's, I'm like around, I'm around like four parks that surround me. So I have low, I have loads of trees to go from and I just, I pick them up, man. Any, any big size log, I'm literally, every time I'm riding my bike or going around seeing I'm like, is that a log I can take home? All right, I'm gonna come back later and circle around and get that log. And I'll keep, I got like, I got like four or five logs in the garage right now just waiting to be used, man. Like. Awesome. I feel like all of us have those uh, those secret staff. <laughs> yeah. a bunch of trees and stuff. 
<laughs> oh yeah. Yeah, even my even my leaf litter. I had someone the other day ask me where I get my leaf litter from. Where the parks, they 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 uh, regularly sweep up all the leaves and put them in bags for me. So when they do that, I just go collect the bags. I'm like, well, now I got my supply of leaves for the whole year for free. You know, <laughs> that's awesome. That that's what you're gonna say, Brandon. Though, as you saw him on the bike. Yeah, I was gonna bring out. I was like, this man's so dedicated that he straps a log on his bike, dude, and just yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah, I used to have a cargo bike where I would take down. Now that, that made everything easier when I had that. Yeah. Um, I and I sold that so I can go to Batanta. But uh, I had the cargo bike where it had a long bed. It was pretty much like a truck of a bike, and I would just stack on like like a hundred, like three hundred pounds worth of wood on there, haul it <laughs> home, and I'll be good to go. You know, that's awesome. Nice man. That's, yeah, I I feel like a lot of people probably get discouraged about that, but you just got to go look, I guess, and. Go to the parks. I want to do it, man. Yeah. yeah. Just got to want to do it. You got just trees everywhere, man. Where there's yeah. trees, there's logs. I promise you. Yeah. <laughs> yeah I get I get lucky because I live, I'm about 10 minutes from the Mississippi River, man. So Ooh, whenever I want logs, I get like pristine driftwood like crazy. Like Jack's seen my, my log pile in my backyard. It's like, wow, dude. It's massive. I just, every, anytime I'm out there when I, in my truck or me and the girlfriend's out doing something, I had trash bags. I'll fill it with leaf litter. I'll pick up sticks. Yeah, up. Yeah. But I have like a gorgeous pile of wood in the backyard just waiting to be used, man. That's what's up, man. I can't wait till I get out of the city so I can have that. Like I live near the water too. So I mm -hmm. get sometimes I get some options, but I'm not, it's like city, you know? So it's like city yeah. river. It's not like, it's not like forest river. So it's, I get, I gotta be lucky. I can find a gym or two here. And there, you know? Yeah. Oh yeah, absolutely. So, um, Really quick, back to the uh, the heat lights that you've got. I know that you've got the way you've built them now. Like you were saying, they they used to be like free with the cord and everything like that. But now that you've got like a PVC pipe or something, can you explain yeah. like how they're built now? Yeah, of course. And I'm, I'm going to make an actual updated video on that because I have one on my Instagram. And now yeah. I just like send it out to whoever acts as like, oh, I've made it like a year or two ago. But, but it's like I found uh, PVC tubing that you use for like, you know, regular plumbing or even like mm -hmm. the stuff they use conduit tubing that they use uh, to route electrical wires and stuff. Yeah. And and then I, I started looking around at how these fittings work with each other and things like that. And and just going to my local Lowe's, I found the perfect combination of like tubing to like female put a female fitting to male fitting. Uh, and then I found a terracotta pot that mm -hmm. was big enough to accommodate the entire light switch and boxes and everything. Like so pretty much the base is a terracotta pot. Pretty big terracotta pot. I wish I could turn around to show you guys, but my camera's stable. But it's it's a terracotta pot, um, and around the terracotta pot, inside of there is a, uh, a a light dome. And actually, let me. I'll get you some of the parts so I can show you this, guys. You guys yeah, 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 that's that works. And for anyone listening, we're definitely going to link Eddie's Instagram in the uh, description. So. You can definitely go check that out. Uh, that's where I saw this is on there. So yeah, it's it's super cool, and I love it. Just the innovation alone is insane. Yeah, it's very impressive. I can't wait to talk about these enclosures back here, man. If you're yeah. not watching and you're listening, you should go like at least you know tune love. into the YouTube channel just so you can see the background here. It's it's incredible. Yeah, man. I already have so many questions. That's like not even on our list of questions. I know. Man. I know. <laughs> far off the deep end here we've got yeah, to just those plants and like how lush they are and everything yeah man it's like the legit the legit zoo setups man yeah. like he's very humble about it but it's insane like it's yeah. just it's, yeah it. i keep going on mute for listeners I, i'm sick right now so i keep going on mute when i'm coughing so so, <laughs> so i don't i don't have I don't have everything to show you guys mm -hmm. exactly how they're made, uh, but pretty much I start off with something like this, right? Let's pretend this is my terracotta pot. It's just an actual nursery pot, but I build mm -hmm. the entire thing around here. And on terracotta pots, they have a drainage at the bottom. Yep. So I use I use these ceramic fixtures, which you probably guys are all aware of. You can buy these everywhere at Lowe's. Uh, and this I have I usually have a metal plate. that's like an insulation plate that has mm -hmm. like the fittings that you attach this to. This yep. will go here. Uh, obviously, I, I found all the fittings for the pole, the, the PVC pole that attaches here. Uh, and then I get a base that it all attaches to. I really wish I had everything here because I would love <laughs> to show you guys, you know, like how, how I do it. Uh, yeah. But 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 it, it, it literally cost me maybe like 
fifteen dollars in materials to make one of these guys, you know. And you can make, obviously put your own line on here to make it as long or as short as you need. Uh, and you can cut the PVC pipe to do it as long as you need. Like in my enclosures in the back, I have three lamps, and each one has one of those poles on it. So I mm -hmm. stagger them. One is like real short, one's medium, one's real long that goes to the bottom. Um, and the reason is to give my animals gradient, uh, and they also protect all the electric electrical components from touching water as well you know so yeah. that's a, that's a really cool part on there as well that if you want maybe i can take my i can swivel my my cage around so you can see it if you want to see it in action that's that's up to you man. yeah i could do that man i definitely won't say no for sure <laughs> yeah we won't deny a, a free show here mm -mm. not at all i just love the, these heat lamps because they're you know, I think everyone feels pretty like restricted to what you can buy at a yeah. store, you know, with lighting. It's like you don't really want to make your own lighting at the time, but it's really pretty straightforward. Um, just make sure you're doing it right so you don't electrocute yourself or something. Um, and they're, they're fully customizable too, which is like, you know, you can't just go buy that, you know. Yeah. And and like oh. he was saying, like they're, they're waterproof because of that. Um, well, not waterproof, but like because you're spraying down. Yeah. Like, hopefully, I can keep that going here. Yeah. Um, so, you can, I wish I could do, let me see if I can uh, move this a little bit here. Sorry, guys. This is a no, you're good, man. Oh, you're good, man. So, that's kind of the setup. You can, I hope you guys can see that. Here. Yeah, we can uh, see it. Or maybe there's another one right here you can kind of see there. Let me open yeah. it up. I love it. Yeah, the, perfect, the perfect setup. Yeah. So you can kind of see it there, how it's built out. So it's pretty much uh, a terracotta pot. And right there, you can see that it's like a, a conduit fitting on the top of that. Uh, you yep. can probably see a better, better, better thing right there. But it's like a fitting. Yeah. The, the lamp comes down. Uh, and then from the top, if you can see that, oh, it's super bright. Oh, I wish you could see it. But you can see that's how the lamp sits inside of there. Oh, okay. Yeah. And everything like that. So it's all it's all safe and everything like that from the animals. Um, there's another example of a hanging one right there yeah. um, where you can kind of see the lamp and everything like that. But they're attached to the ceiling with like a fixing plate. Um, yeah. mm -hmm. And it just, it just uh, yeah, like they're made so that I can obviously heat up the ground. You can see that the ground's all hot and everything like that. And they're just protected to make sure that the cage doesn't or the water doesn't wet this inside and electrocute whatever's inside of that. So yeah. sorry for the blurriness and everything like that. Was, no, you're good, dude. That was amazing. Thank you. That's awesome. That's so cool, man. And yeah, just it's... like offering three different gradients in a cage like that for I mean monitors especially but for really anything. You build a large enclosure for something like that to offer more than one hotspot like most people do is you know it, it only All right. we're back out. Sorry. <laughs> Sorry for the little field trip, John. <laughs> that was awesome. That was awesome. I love how it's it too. Like those those fixtures look a lot better than like your standard light fixture that you would get, you know? Like whether you're yeah. using the black ones that you would get from like PetSmart or something, or you or you're using, you know, the the metal like the aluminum ones you would get at Home Depot or something, but yeah, and you, and you can customize them however you want because you can paint yeah. them, you know. Like, yeah. I, I just painted in the black because I thought it'll look cool. But if somebody wanted to get creative and like throw you know silicone and moss all over it and everything like yeah. that, you can do it as long as it doesn't touch the bulb, you know, and it'll yeah. look really nice in there, you know. Yeah, and it's just what like zoos do. Like, I feel like in a zoo, you almost never see basking spots because they're you know, hidden back behind like the background or, or like that or yeah. whatever. But yeah. um, I love that, man. That's, that's the epitome of, of DIY is, is something like that. <laughs> it's like, fig like that's such a simple thing, but you, the way you did it allowed you to, to completely customize your basking spots and make them look a ton better too. So. Yeah, because previously when they were hanging, the problem was like, yeah, I can put them in a situation, but a monitor jumps on it, then it swings around and it moves around. This is more stable. Um, mm -hmm. As well, the first time I did it, I didn't have a way to like uh, waterproof it that was like safe enough. Yeah. And this that that was really the, the biggest concern was how do I keep this from water from getting inside of it and 
mucking it all up and stuff like that. So this is yeah. the best solution that I found. And now I share, I, I've gotten so many people asking me about that particular thing. And I, I just, whenever they are, I just share them the link, but I'm going to make a new one or maybe I'll, I'll repost the, the one that I did previously so that people can see how it's done. Cause I go through the materials, what I buy, how to yeah. make it, how to paint it. And I do say disclaimer, like, if you don't know how to do electricity, yeah. don't yeah. don't kill yourself. Like just yeah. Yeah. if you if you set up lights before, cool. But if you don't ask somebody, so you don't burn your house down. I yeah. don't want to be responsible for people burning their houses down. Yeah, <laughs> yeah absolutely. Like, we don't want to give electrical advice on here, but just yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> like Eddie, Eddie told me to do it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. No, one thing I one thing I, I've been harping on on all these episodes, man, is is if you didn't try to do that. Just, just try. Trying is like ninety percent of it, you know. Yeah, exactly, exactly. you gotta, you gotta try. You gotta put in a little bit of effort, and it might not work the first time, but you just keep going. It snowballs, and eventually, yeah. you know, you're, you're building some cool stuff. You know that that somebody yeah. can, can get ideas off of and take that and build on top of it. You know. Yeah, yeah, I can't. I can't wait to see what the next guys end up making here and stuff like that. Like, I got a good friend right now who's working with. Um, he's working with. Uh, 3D background hydroponic systems oh, where wow. it's like, yeah. So it's like crazy what he's doing where he's building. It's like, it's a, it's a, a recycling water yeah. feature that yeah. like it waters the plants, goes down, fertilizes the plants all built into a background. Yeah. Like, dude, that's the freaking future. You know, yeah. it's European, but like, but like, I'm just like, dude, that's the future. I can't yeah. wait for more. You guys like you come out here and do this so I can, yeah. Try to implement my own style of that, you know, like so. Yeah, yeah dude, I, I love that's, trying. I love the people trying. That's I've actually been planning something like that too. I've got a. We were talking about Kevin, my Cayman, so I've got a, a pond for him. But in my next enclosure, he's gonna do like uh, I'm gonna do like rain gutters essentially. Oh yeah, and yeah just yeah, have yeah. like layers of that. So I've got like a living wall on the back, but it's just gonna be run out of his pond. So it's got you know, all the nutrients and stuff in there anyway. Like he, yeah. he's the tilapia in the, in the hydroponics farm or whatever. Right. That would be cool, yeah. man. That would yeah. be super cool. Yeah. yeah it's, and, and I think that's the next move for that stuff, you know? Yeah. Yeah. If you, if you're, if you got aquatics, like Brendan and I talk about this too, because we, we both keep fish is like using plants for filtration is, is that's the, that's the best way to do it because it's, it's nature. It's like how it was intended to do. We've, we've created all these workarounds to try to get back to way, the way nature does it. But if you can just do it the exact same way it would be done in the wild, it makes everything easier, you know? It makes sense too, man. Yeah. So that's awesome. But I think we, we got to get into these enclosures back here, man. Like they're, they're, teasing, <laughs> yeah, man. they're, they're teasing us too much. Um, <laughs> I think first, like if we want to start with just generalized construction of them, and so we talked about their elevated and stuff like that. But if you want to talk about like materials and, and your kind of initial design plan for them, um, and then we can talk through interior and everything like that. Yeah. Yeah, man. So the uh, initial design was they, they went through a couple iterations and uh, because I, I had built them in a way that I was going to always use sliding glass doors, but the original sliding glass doors that I had were floor to ceiling uh, glass okay. doors. And mm -hmm. it was almost like a like a uh, the, a window would be the box that like meshed with the sliding door, and you just slide it out the way, and then you open up fully to the cage. That gotcha. was originally what we were going to build. Um, but they were always going to be elevated, and then we bought the glass, and we realized that this was really dangerous. And my my partner was like, "Well, I don't want this glass to fall on you and smush you or something like yeah. that." So we scrapped that, and we moved to this sliding glass style that we have here. Okay. Um, but it's it's OSB. Uh, and they're all built on their own uh, dolly system. Uh, two yeah. cages. Each cage is built on its own dolly system. Uh, and um, female cages are seven foot tall, uh, three feet deep, four feet wide. Male cages are seven foot tall, three feet deep, three feet wide. Okay. Um, and uh, again, on their own dolly. So each each male and female is on own dolly cage, a uh, dolly system. Um, and it's all OSB wood. Um, everything is treated on the inside to prevent it from rotting out. We'll, we'll talk about that later and everything yeah. like that. And yeah, that's, that's pretty much it. The trim is just a regular pine trim that I put on here just to hide all the ugliness so that mm -hmm. when I put the glass on there and everything looks nice. Mm -hmm. um, there's a, a drainage system on the bottom. Yeah, there's a three inch, there's a three inch drain on each, each enclosure that connects 
both male and female cages into one main valve that opens and closes so I can drain the enclosures out as I need it. Mm -hmm. um, and is that just yeah, like a shower yeah. drain or is that like a – Oh, and it's like a PVC. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Shower drain. It's like a shower yeah. drain that you get inside of there. Uh, gotcha. That sandwich, that sandwich in between of a, a pond liner on the inside, as well okay. as the cage itself being a, a waterproof as well with dry lock and and all bunch of other stuff inside of there. But there's a pond liner on top of that, and then a, a, a shower drain to a three inch gotcha. pipe that's then connected to one valve, two cages to one valve. So when I drain, both cages drain at the same time. Gotcha. Yeah. Gotcha. What um what kind of tools did you need to to build these? Oh, lucky me, man, that I've been building so many cages and fucking up so much that I, <laughs> I've accumulated all the tools that I needed to yeah. do this. But I use everything from I have my own miter saw. I have my own circular saw. I have two drills. Uh, I have uh, pocket hole jigs. Those are real helpful for what yeah. I need and everything like that here. Um, I use my staple gun. Lots of paint brushes and my my screwdrivers. Really, that was it, man. Those yeah. kind of like a handful of tools, and I was able to do all this stuff. The biggest thing was having access to a miter saw and yeah, a yeah. and a, a circular saw. Oh, and then a, a guide, like a, a, one of those little long straight yeah. edges, so you yeah. can cut the wood straight. If you have those tools, you can build a whole damn house if you want to. Honestly, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's what we were talking about in, in uh, one of the episodes. I can't remember, but it's just like. You don't need a ton of tools to, to start building cages. You just need like a select few and you can kind of acquire those as you like move through projects. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. Have to be all at once. And yeah. you go to like a, a pawn shop or something like that, you can you can kind of get these tools at a, at a discount because people are always trading up and stuff. So my friend put me on. I don't know if you guys have this over there, but we have what's called Harbor Freight over here in New York oh, yeah. City. Yeah, Harbor, dude, you can get whatever tool you want there for like ten dollars, man. You get they'll <laughs> break in like a year, but they'll get the job done. Yeah, you know? <laughs> that's yeah, that's all you need. Yeah, yeah. yeah I, like, okay. Sorry, like I, I ended up getting all my clamps. Now I have like certain clamps and jigs yeah. so that I can build a cage. Like I can build a cage in like a couple hours now because all the clamping and the wow. jigging and stuff like that. Now, but but yeah, no, man, you buy it from there. Clamps and jigs, you get those, and then everything else second, you'll you'll be good to go. I promise. You can build whatever you want. Yeah. Well, we're gonna say, man, sorry to, sorry no, to no, you're good. I, I was just gonna say, like all, all those extra tools, like like you only need the core ones, and then everything else just makes it easier. It's like if yeah. you got a drill and a saw, like you know, you can do pretty much everything. It's just everything else makes it a whole lot simpler. Um, yeah, I used to do this with a corded saw. The first cages I built, I built it with one corded saw. And I, I mean, with one quarter drill, and yeah. I had to drill the pilot holes, change the bit, drill it, come back. And that was like, dude. And I only had, I had to use the extension cord. And yeah. I was like, bro, I need, I need a, I need a cordless drill. And then yeah. I got the cordless drill, and I was like, all right, damn. Now I'm still drilling and changing bits. Let me get the the impact driver and the drill. You know, and like now, now I get. Yeah. But that's how you do it. As you build, you learn what you need, and then you go from there and add to your collection. Yeah. 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 It's it's just as you go. That's how it goes. <laughs> That's awesome, man. Um, okay, so so exterior we just covered. So you were saying dry lock on the inside is how you sealed it. Yeah. So dry lock and man, when that that was, I will tell you that was probably the biggest cost. And and if I did this again, I would not do that. Right. I I, I did it the first time with the wood uh, and the dry lock and. It was a whole mess. I'll tell you yeah. what, man. I, I I paid at the time. I paid more in dry lock than I paid in wood, just for just yeah. for examples. Yeah, and yeah. I, and if I had known that going into that the first time, I would have never done it this way. Um, but I had bought. I probably went through like I want to say, like twenty gallons of dry lock to make this stuff to so so yeah. I can feel secure that it was like waterproof, right? I want yeah. this. I wanted this thing to be able to float down the Hudson if I wanted to, you know, but like, but, um, but, uh, I, so I ended up putting at least like six, I want to say six to eight layers of dry lock on each okay. panel on these enclosures on each wow. panel. And so that was a lot of paint that I had to go through plus the silicone and everything like that. And originally I had no, I had no, uh, I had no, um, uh, palm liner. I had just, straight dry lock in the drain and i was like oh these cages are perfect and within i would say like four months of doing that i found my first leak on my enclosures oh. you know i had done everything and i was like shit that's it i found a leak that's 
that's the end of this. It's gonna, it's yeah. gonna have to, I'm gonna have to scrap all this stuff. So I had to scrap everything at that time. These were not were on a on a permanent fixture base. So mm -hmm. I used the opportunity to remove everything off that fixture base and build the dolly system that they're on now so I can move the cages. Yeah. That gave me an excuse to to empty out every single cage, let out every cage dry, put another coat of dry lock in the inside, put some more silicone, and then I added a pawn liner to every single cage. Um, and then now that pawn liner is is foolproof for the most part now, um, but it's it's just an extra barrier so that the water never touches the wood at the bottom, you know. Mm -hmm. And so if I were if I would have done this, if I would have known that at the beginning, I would have got the wood, maybe put two or three coats of dry lock on the inside, put a pawn liner at the bottom, and I would have say it would have saved me a thousand dollars at least doing it that way, you know, compared to the first time. Nice. Yeah, that's I feel like because I've used dry lock for a ton of different things, um, especially in the Cayman enclosure. And it it's fine for like sealing against humidity and even like if something's going to run off of it. But if it's if it's water sitting on top, it eventually it'll seep, seep in and it'll yeah, like yeah. go through it. So and that's um, my problem. I didn't think of that because I, I was building a false bottom. So mm -hmm. that bottom is perpetually wet until yeah. I drain it. And that's what let that water to soak through and eventually find a, a break in and, and that top on the leak and everything like that. But now I know you learn from doing this stuff, yep. you know? Yeah, absolutely. Okay, so dry liner, dry, uh, dry lock and then pond liner. Um, I guess let's just go bottom up. So your what's your dirt layer look like? And did you do that all yourself or did you buy? I can't imagine you bought that much dirt like already made or anything. No, 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 no. So, so, so. I have on top of the pawn liner, I have a false bottom. Okay. So it's like it's like two inches of, of a elevated system. And so what I did to make it like strong enough to withstand all the dirt in the log is I, I was able to find uh, abandoned bread racks, right? I don't know if you know what a bread rack is, like the little plastic yeah, stuff yeah. that you carry the bread on. Okay. Uh, it's like it's like a plastic crate, like egg crate, but it's just okay. super durable and thick. And I cut that to size. And I put that on top. And that's like my egg crate layer that you see sometimes in the small mm -hmm. exoteric cages. And I put a mesh mm -hmm. on top of that so that the, the the dirt can't like run through it and it's filtered. Mm -hmm. And then on top of that, I have my dirt. And my dirt layer is a is a mixture of, of dirt that's been like kind of been recycled for like four years now of like dirt that I've collected from outside, dirt that I've bought, sand that I've bought. But I would say it's like a it's like a 30% mixture of play sand, 30% mixture of, of like topsoil and outside dirt, and then a 30% mixture of like peat moss. You okay. know? So because yeah. multiple layers of stuff, but some this uh some of the dirt's been sitting outside for like two years. Some of the, so it's like kind of like composting itself and recycling yeah. itself and breaking down and everything like that. Plus parts when I put leaf litter and that breaks down and everything like that. So and then when I see it kind of like break down too much, I add more. So some of it is bought, a lot of it sticking outside from outside and mixed mm -hmm. into this stuff. But it's just a it's just a big mix of, of a lot of stuff. But I would say each enclosure, if my enclosure is if my enclosure has like two inches of of I would say like this much is is the drainage layer, and I would say like that much is dirt that's on top of all these enclosures. So it's pretty, it's relatively deep like yeah. enclosure, you know. But and I think that's why I do so well with the plants that I'm yeah. able to have them grow really well because they're they're able to build a giant root system inside of these enclosures mm -hmm. um, and really flourish. And and as well as that, the humidity stays very well because as the bottom gets wet from the mist, the lamp. Mm -hmm. Uh, 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 you know, uh, what's it called? Heats up that bottom water uh, enclosure, mm -hmm. rises up the humidity, and it just helps keep everything inside of there fresh and kind of cycling and everything like that. Yeah, absolutely. It's the way nature nature does it. Exact same. <laughs> way. Yeah. Um, yeah. I know we were we were talking a little bit before we started recording, but what kind of what kind of bugs and stuff are you rocking in that dirt, man? I know you got a bunch of stuff in there. Oh, dude, I got, yeah, I got so many, I got so many different little critters inside of here, man. I have everything from, I, some, uh, uh, one of my friends sent me a big care package of isopods. Um, mm -hmm. And so I, I threw in a bunch of like dairy cows and like poison some things and some Japanese, a lot of different <laughs> stuff in there. I don't know. Yeah. The, I don't know the isopod names, but my dude, thank you so much. Shout out to you who sent me the, the care package of those guys. So I spread that out. So I got isopods in every single enclosure. I have a garden millipedes. If you guys don't know, those are they're like a little wriggly millipede that eats 
plant matter and everything like that inside of there. And they also eat uh, uh, like uh, flesh as well. They'll eat like dead mice or something like that anytime in there. So they're, they're really okay. cool at decomposing stuff in there. I have uh, night crawlers. I have red wigglers in there. Um, I have regular uh, millipedes in there. I have crickets galore. I have tons of the variety of, of, of um, uh, springtails and other little like dirt mites. So it's, it's, it's a really rich ecosystem in there to the point where like if for whatever reason, let's say one of my animals doesn't eat its, its food for the day. Let's say I put a, a quail in there and the quail happens to drop and I don't see it. The next day, half of that quill is gone from all the stuff in the bottom eating it, you know? Yeah. Um, and they've, they've never affected my animals. They never go to my animals to eat. And I can open any one of these enclosures. And if I open it, it smells like dirt. It doesn't smell like a zoo or anything like that. It smells like earth in there, you know, which is which is really cool. And it's and I think it, ha it has to do with that composting dirt that I've been like kind of like taken care of for the past four years. And I mix and match with these animals because of the animals are clean. Everybody is like parasite free. Everyone is really cool. Everyone can cohab with each other. So I'm able to move around stuff here easily. That's why I keep my, my rooms really closed and clean. Um, yeah. And, and yeah, and it just works out really well for that sort of stuff, you know, but these, yeah, these right, cages yeah. are alive, man. They're hella alive right now. <laughs> yeah. It, it's funny when you said the smell thing, it's like, you know, we all know what the reptile smell smells like, and especially yeah. <laughs> um, animals and racks, like you, you smell that a lot. But if you got bioactive enclosures going, you don't, I, you don't smell anything. Like it's, yeah, yeah. it's, it just smells like the forest when you walk in your your reptile room, which is sick. It's the yeah, best yeah. Thing I love ever. that part. Yeah, it, it makes it easier for when my girl, you know, when my lady's here and she's like, "Oh, why do you have all these animals?" It's like at least it don't smell like a fucking yeah, tea. yeah, yeah. <laughs> Absolutely, yeah. man. <laughs> That's so cool. I've been wanting to. Uh, so, in terms of the worms and stuff, I always hear people say that whenever they put worms in their enclosures, they die really quickly. I'm assuming. I'm assuming that's not a problem that you have. No, 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 not at all. It, and, and I think it has to do with a number of factors. The fact that I have a drainage layer. Like mm -hmm. an actual drainage layer, so like the 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 water's always like it doesn't sit inside the 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 dirt and it like bogs down. Mm -hmm. I think yeah. when people keep worms in there, it's they're dying because they're drowning because they don't have a way to drown to like to drain that water out of there. Um, mm -hmm. It's heated as well, so the 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 dirt is pretty much like warm, you know. And the yeah. mist because I'm misting and dumping water out and everything like that, it's always moist. It's never like bone dry. So it's a perfect environment for those animals. It's like if you go underneath, when you pick up a log and it's like that really soft, loamy dirt, that's what this dirt feels like in here. It's never a hard, compact dirt. It's a really soft, loamy, like a burrable dirt, if I can, like if it's the best way to describe it, you know? Yeah. Yeah. I think that's where people go wrong is just maintaining their dirt. It's like you either spray in too much or you're spraying too light or... Um, yeah, it's not yeah, deep yeah. enough to maintain consistency because I think the depth is like huge in, in allowing it to stay at a constant level of like, you know, it, it, the more you have, the easier it is to like maintain it. It's like the same thing yeah, as yeah. an aquarium, like the more water volume you have, it's just more, you know, stable. Um, yeah, and I, I didn't, I'm not I'm not gonna say that I'm a dirt expert. I didn't do this. I didn't do all this stuff <laughs> yeah. thinking I knew what I was doing. I was yeah. just adding dirt. And I was like, ah, it looks like it's enough, and and it's yeah. worked out, you yeah. know. Which is it's an added plus to that. So, yeah. but I'd recommend anybody if you want to do something similar. The deeper you go, the easier it is. I found to maintain the live animals, the the plants. Like I got pothos growing in here that I collected from Puerto Rico a year ago. That's, that's growing crazy. from the bottom of the cage all the way to the top. Like it's. Like stuff is growing really well, no matter what I do, it doesn't die. And I have to periodically trim yeah. the growth in here because they will overgrow, you know, from how much I, and I don't add fertilizers or none of that stuff to yeah. this. This is all natural from whatever's inside that enclosure that's growing this stuff. Yeah. yeah. You got the nature's fertilizer. Yeah. <laughs> Lizards, yeah. <laughs> well, I guess I guess let's uh let's talk about the plants then, man. What kind of plants yeah. are you rocking in these cages? They look they look amazing from from the video. Like in all the videos you post and stuff, they're always they always look like they're flourishing. 
Yeah, thank you, man. I only have like a, a select couple of, of plants, to be quite honest, but I think it's just how massive it grows that makes the illusion that it's so much. But for the most part, I have the biggest plant inside of these are the uh, the Puerto Rican, or, or I guess they're just the golden pothos, right? It's a, it's yeah. a giant golden pothos um, that when I was in Puerto Rico, I found out that I could bring plants from Puerto Rico to the U.S. because we're the same, you know, country. And so I would find, I went out there and I found these giant vines. They were like just humongously thick, like three inches around vines. And I would cut them into sections. I found out how to cut them, threw them in the plant in the cage, and they just sprout. They sprouted like crazy. And now they grow. They, they're taking over the enclosure, which is beautiful. It just, it covers yeah. the bottom. I have that. I have, I started off with um, uh, the, the, the umbrella plant. I don't know. I think it's like the dwarf, it's called a dwarf umbrella plant. Yep. That was another cool plant that I that I originally started off with. And those guys started off like little shrubs. And now they're like halfway up through the enclosure wow. as well, growing up, which is really beautiful. Um, and then last year I added, because what I really want, my my, my ultimate plan in a couple of years, and I'm investing in time now, is I bought uh, mini uh, ficus trees for each enclosure. Each enclosure mm-hmm. now has its own ficus tree that's growing. Yeah. Uh, and they're, 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 they're 100% growing. And the plan is I'm going to like train the ficus tree. So when it's two, three years, four years, five years down the line, it's going to be a centerpiece tree in the middle of the enclosure that then everything grows around. You know, it's going to be a big trunk and then that's going to be the mean thing. And then everything grows around the ficus tree. So I invested that in. I put those in this year to let them grow. And and then later on, we'll move them around and everything like that as we need to and, and train them as we need to. So, but in a couple of years, hopefully that's the vision for those. And then I have money tree, I have money plant as well. Um, and whatever I get at the Home Depot uh, discount cart, I'll just throw it in there and see what happens. <laughs> nice, nice. Well, that's, that's a great place to go to get some, some discount. Yeah, dude. <laughs> A five dollar plant, two dollar plant. Why not? Let's see how it goes. If you look cool, you keep it. If not, we'll feed you to the turtle or something like that. You know. <laughs> Wait, do you have a turtle? I have a. Uh, someone gave us a, a, a red foot tortoise, a baby nice. red foot tortoise. So nice. it's like it's a little tortoise, like this big. Okay. And uh, once it went once it went through quarantine, uh, I made sure that it was fine. It was cool. It got a vet visit. Everything was fine. Uh, it now lives in one of the tree monarch cages. Really? It lives, at the, it lives at the bottom. And that little guy, I, I love him. His name yeah. is Tortellini. I love him. <laughs> but 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 he he uh, the tree monitor doesn't mess with him. He's with a, with yeah. a male tree monitor. The tree monitor doesn't mess with him. Uh he, he since he has that lower portion basking, everything's fine. Um yeah, he's yeah. been he's been eating good. He he's like a lawnmower. He just eats <laughs> all the greenery on the bottom. So that yeah. cage is completely bare. Because he just eats everything inside of there. But he, he's cool. He's living there now until the summertime. We'll put him outside so he can get some direct sunlight and everything like yeah. that. And then the future plan is to build him a big tortoise pen. But he's just yeah. so small. He's such a tiny little guy. Yeah. That we're just like, let's just let him grow out a little bit and then we'll build him something cool, you know? That's awesome, yeah. man. I am a I'm a huge turtle nerd. So I, uh, <laughs> you said you had a turtle. I was like, what are you doing? Yeah, not, sorry, not turtle, tortoise. Sorry yeah. about that. I didn't mean to yeah, same thing. Same thing. yeah. <laughs> That's awesome, man. That's so cool. Um, all right. So, um, what what's going on with the backgrounds? Then I think we gotta we gotta talk about those. Oh, man. Those are all right. Cool, cool. Yeah. yeah. So I got I got two things that I've done in the backgrounds. Uh, one of them, you you a lot of people see the regular gray enclosures that I have and everything like that with the full rock walls. Yeah. That's Universal Rock. That's Universal Rock. If you guys know the brand, they're, they're based yeah. out of Texas. Beautiful company. I, I love those dudes so much. Those guys helped out so much with this whole entire building and everything like that. Um, we reached out to them, told them, hey, we're doing this entire thing. They love what we were doing now, and they sponsored my room pretty much. Oh, wow. Nice. They helped, they helped, they helped the, the build go out and everything like that, and they sent us uh, their sheets to try out to see how the monitors would do with them and everything like that. And that was one of the biggest blessings that I could have ever asked for because they really helped out with this, with this entire room building and everything like that. Uh, the other – there's two enclosures that don't have those – because I want to experiment to see how what I can make a fake tree inside mm-hmm. of this enclosure, like a fake buster's tree with incorporated hides. And yeah. I love the universal rock wall, but I love those fake hide cages a lot. 
Mm -hmm. I, it's, it's, it's a, it's a real, it's a real, like, you know, it tears me in both ways because they both yeah. have beautiful, unique value to them. Yeah. Universal rock wall looks pretty. It's beautiful. I don't got to worry about it. Anything that I do, I just spray it off and it's clean. Yeah. But the hide cages is seeing the animals climb up it like it's a tree or oh, I come in and they don't want to see me. They'll go inside one of the hides and hide in there and then look at me like, what are you doing in my enclosure from outside? Yeah. You know, like I love seeing that type of stuff, you know? And it's like, I wish I could do that with these enclosures, but I don't want to ruin the universal rock wall, yeah. you know, by cutting yeah. something in there. So, so I put like my fake hides inside of there, but it's not the same. It's not the same as yeah. seeing like a tree monitor scurry up the tree and then hide inside its, its little hide, like it would do in the wild, you know. So that, yeah. that's really cool. Mm -hmm. And it's cool having like differing enclosures, like not having all of them, you know, be the same. So. Yeah, yeah, yeah. How? Yeah, yeah, the other. Sorry. Okay. You go ahead. No, you. No, you go. You go. Oh, I was gonna say that the 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 butcher's tree that I had, yeah. I built that one out of cement. That's an all cement build. Like I put foam, I yeah. built the foam out of foam, carved the foam down to the shape I wanted, put cement on it, uh, put waterproofing on the cement, and then I painted that by hand. Uh, and then the second enclosure that I have, which is like a, a split middle tree with a bunch of little hides and pots and everything like that growing inside, that was a new method where I use. Uh, still foam, but instead of cement, I use a lightweight, I want to say like a lightweight plaster. Okay. okay. Yeah. Up on top of the plaster, I put Gorilla Glue over it, and I figured the Gorilla Glue would harden real hard, and it did. It hardened rock hard, and then I painted that, and that one, and then I made that whole form, you know, but I wanted something that was like lightweight, because the cement is so heavy, and mm -hmm. so that's why I went with the polymer, the polymer like the lightweight plaster and and, 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 and gorilla glue. So I, I learned a lot of different methods of how to build these fake rock walls and stuff like that now. Yeah. I did a cement enclosure one time and I <laughs> probably won't do it again just because of yeah. how heavy that thing is. It's like, yeah, dude, exactly. Exactly. Yeah. Dude, that's the problem. That's the yeah. problem. As beautiful as it is. I don't want to keep moving around a giant rock, you know, pretty much. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. My, mine's only like a four by three enclosure and it, it i think it probably weighs 400 pounds so i can't yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> well, i'm trying to um go through your instagram really quick separately just to see if i can pull up some of these pictures of these enclosures you built but um if you all want to keep going yeah um, yeah for sure for sure yeah see if you can yeah, find, i know i have some in the past year that i put that i put them up and everything like that and and if you want since this is uh, I can send you those videos straight up. So if you want to plug them into the podcast and everything like that. Yeah. Right. Yeah. That's what we'll do is I'll just edit it afterwards and put them in. Um, yeah, just yeah. Keep moving on. yeah. That's awesome. Um, so, okay. So you said it was the polymer one for the second one. So if you do more, do you think that's what you're going to go with? Yeah. If I did more, I would do a polymer style. Uh, I'm going to work with like, now I'm working with like resins and like yeah. actual, like sculpting epoxy. You know, mm -hmm. so not, I don't know if you guys know Brad from uh, uh, Brad's Bioactive Builds. Uh, yeah. His stuff, like, he, he does amazing stuff and he works with this company, Poly, Poly Germ or something like that, which is an epoxy based resin stuff. So it's a similar product, but not, mm -hmm. not, not that exact product. That's what I use. That's what I will use for the future and everything like that. Did, and I have a really sure. cool uh, experiment that I'm working on right now where I'm actually trying to 3D print the mm -hmm. forms of the backgrounds, okay. interlock them, and then paint them over, seal them up, wow. and everything like that, you know? So so I'll have yeah. these crazy depth layers inside of them that you can't really, you can sculpt them, but it probably will be a lot harder to sculpt them. Yeah. That, that's the next method that I'm trying to really focus with. That'd be amazing. Is it's that really the, it's like, it's gonna take all this to the next level in the next 10 years, dude. It's insane. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I love it. I can't wait. I can't wait to see what that turns into because because going along with my friend with the hydroponic stuff, the plan mm -hmm. with that build is to incorporate ways so that the, the plants can get water and everything like that or be drained into a system behind it, incorporate mm -hmm. foggers, incorporate all this cool stuff because it's 3D printed, you know, and then also a, a topical map almost of, of stuff like that. So there's a lot of cool stuff that, are, that I'm trying to do with that, with that project. You know, I can 3D print the tree right into the background as well yeah. and all this stuff. So, so there's a lot, that's a lot, that's the next wave that I'm going to of the next enclosures that I'm building for these guys. Oh, I'm stoked to see that. Man. That's going to be so cool. Love was that. that, 
Was that polygem resin that you're talking about? Is that the zoopoxy? Is that what it is? Zoopoxy is what I'm. Uh, that's 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 the stuff that Brad uses. Yeah, zoopoxy, okay. the polygem zoopoxy. Yeah, gotcha, I'm yeah. using a I'm using a, a product because it's easy for me to get here in New York City, uh, which is Smooth On. Smooth On. I don't know if you know that, but it's it's a similar. It's a U.S. based brand that does a similar product that that, that I use. Oh, nice. Yeah, that's new poxy stuff. I know uh, Mike Stefani uses that a lot in his in his enclosures too, and it looks yeah. insane. I know it's it yeah. gets pricey, but I think it's it looks like it's worth it, and he loves it. Yeah. And it holds up the water falls and stuff too, man. So like for the stuff that I'm doing, these little geckos and everything, it'd be freaking bulletproof, you know? Yeah, yeah. Brad uses the hell out of that stuff, and he and yeah. his enclosures are amazing, you know. And they're 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 for his coming eye and all that stuff. So they they gotta be well. Yeah. You know, so what he's doing. yeah, they're top tier, man. He's got the raptor claws going into him. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, yeah, we talked to Brad about coming on. He, we're definitely going to get him on as a oh, guest yeah. for sure. Yeah. He's he, he like just like you, man. Like the two of you guys, like for monitors, is like, I mean, that's that's top tier. Like you guys are really doing <laughs> it, especially for. I think it's, you know, it's it's hard enough doing this these kind of enclosures for like a gecko or something that's that's smaller. But when you add in something that has the ability to like rip things apart and it's just massive, you know, like you got to yeah. build a much larger yeah. enclosure. It's it's a whole nother game. It's it's much more complex. So most um, definitely, man. Yeah, but you guys are killing it. So um, I love it. So uh, what are the hides in that in that one resin one that you're talking or both of them, um, the concrete and the resin one that you've done? What, how are they integrated into it and how do the monitors use those? So I uh, earlier in the year, in the past year, I developed like a canopy system hide that I made. It's like a fake three D printed hide that yeah. I made for my tree monitors. And uh, when I first experimented with putting them in the enclosure, the tree monitors were utilizing them. They were they were hiding in them, keeping inside of them. I was able to put leaf litter in there and dirt, moss, and everything like that. And the animals sleep in them. Every single one of my cages has one, and my animals sleep inside of those inside of those things at night. And so what I did is I took some of like my failures that I've had here and that like they look ugly or they didn't print right or something like that. And I use this as the basis. And then I will like put foam over or, or, or put it inside the foam and then the cement or the resin or anything like that on top oh, of that. So they're just, it's using that as a body. And then the rest of it is covered up with the foam and then the cement or whatever, whatever product I'm using on top of that, you know? Nice, man. That's so awesome. What was, what was like the initial, like, how'd you come up with that idea? Like, was it just through watching them in the wild or understanding their habits in the wild? Or Yeah, let me, let me get one so you guys can, so I can show you guys. Hold on. Yeah. If I'm you haven't there. seen these, you should definitely look at Eddie's Instagram. He's got these up there, yeah. too. <laughs> so this is one that I made. Uh, this is one that I made just for fun. Um, but pretty much um, this is this is the hide right here, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and if people see that. The, the, the reason why I came up with it is the idea was inspired from, from termite mounds, right? And uh, so I, 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 I've done the research and I've seen the termite mounds in, in Indonesia, but what it came down to was when I was investigating monitor species that live out in the wild, you would see that a lot of these guys that were arboreal, when they lay eggs, they were laying their eggs. Some monitor species were laying eggs inside of hollows, inside of trees, some monitor species like the, um, uh, what's these guys called? The, the lace monitor, they actually mm -hmm. dig into termite mounds and they lay into termite mounds. Uh, and mm -hmm. there's also bird species that dig into termite mounds and and, uh, and go in there to lay nests or eat the termites, et cetera. So I wanted to make something that replicated the imagery or the look of a termite mound uh, with this. Um, and so it's, it's a fully hollow item uh, that they can go in here. It's big enough. They can crawl inside of, and I have two of them sometimes sleep in one of them. So it's, it's a pretty big item. Uh, but the second thing that I did was I made all these viewing holes because it looks almost like a termite nest. But the second reason was so that the monitor could see from the outside in mm -hmm. as well. You know, that was another thing was to make sure that the monitor wasn't in a place where it like it, was, it felt trapped. It could see what was going on in every direction from here to feel secure. And they just adopted it very well. You know, I, I've put them in there and I've tested them out for the past, I want to say like year and a half, two years now. And they use it. I've sent these guys all over the world. People all over the world use them. They didn't have no issues with them or anything like that. So it's been really cool. I I, I stopped 
producing them for sale for the most part. Now I'm picking up a little bit again on these guys because it's like a lot to print one of these guys to be quite yeah. honest. This, oh, this yeah. thing takes yeah. like this thing takes like a day and a half to print one of these, you know. Yeah. So because of the scale and how much detail goes inside of it, so you don't mess it up. Um, but no, man, it, it's just mimicry from the wild. Seeing termite mounds and the 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 patterns that are going there, and and that's how we came up with the design and stuff like that. And when it's mounted and it's like the right color and everything like that, it looks killer, man. Honestly, yeah, yeah it looks really good. I kind of like the uh, the color you got there. That's kind of cool. Oh, the, the Easter egg color, yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah my, my, my lady was like, "You should get this imprinted for fun," and I was like, "Okay, let's." So we 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 came up with this one. It was cool. Yeah, I wasn't expecting it to be this color when we got it because it was like from the outside it looked green. So I thought it was gonna be like a like it would go from like bluish to like green, and then it came out like an Easter egg. And there we go. <laughs> it's, kind of sick, man. it's like a fancy rock. I like it. <laughs> That's awesome. Did you did you figure out how to like three D print and everything on your own, or was, did you take like classes or like I feel like that's kind of a complex. That's like further than DIY. That's like professional stuff right there. Yeah, man. Funny enough, so I learned how to three D print. Uh, I want to say like six years ago, seven years ago, I worked in the bike industry and I got into 3D printing because I wanted to learn how to build my own bicycle frame. So I'm, 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 real, I'm real tall. I'm, I'm six foot three. And okay. so for me to get bikes, I either like, there's only like a such height limit that they have for bikes. And after yeah. you're a certain height, you got to get a custom frame built for you. So that's yeah. your, so you can feel comfortable. So my plan was at the time, to 3D print a frame and then have it made out of carbon. So like 3D print a positive, take that positive, make a negative, and then make out of carbon and then all this other stuff. So I, I bought my first like two 3D printers, learned how to do CAD design so I can make bike frames. Um, got very good at designing products with the 3D print, with, with the CAD design. And then I wasn't keeping lizards at the time. Fast forward, I keep lizards, and I'm like, well, I still have these 3D printers. I know how to do this stuff. And then designs came up, and, and, and now we're here. You know, It started with the first animal design I made was a 3D printed cup holder, which some of you guys can see in my in my Instagram. But I came up with that idea like four years ago, the first year I got into tree monitors because I wanted a way to feed my animals, feed and water my animals. So I came up with that design. And it was inspired by what other people were doing in the past with like bird feeders and things like that. But I came up with that idea and then it came up, then I came up with the hides and other uh, little plant holders and all this other stuff and everything like that. But no, it was completely separate from this. It was just learning how to build bike frames, man. <laughs> the 3D printer thing, man, it's so interesting because it's, it's basically endless. Like you can pretty much make anything that you want with a 3D printer. As long as you have the time and the know-how to do it, I mean, there, dude, there's so much stuff you can do with these animals, just 3D printed. It's yeah, so, man. yeah. And like, that's, you make so, that's so, now too. Yeah, it's so far ahead of like my know-how, but man, guys like you that can actually like do that thing and like make it look legit, I'm I'm so envious of it, man. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, all your products are amazing, man. I I've, I've been following it for a long time and just seeing because it's it's like a it's like a gap. Like you kind of need um those like arboreal feeders and waterers for the monitors just to make sure that they're eating um especially before you implemented this thing on the ground you know um yeah. or the the heat lights to bring them down to the ground but like because they are spending so much time in the trees it's like you got to have a way to do that and i guess you could probably like adapt like bird feeders or something to do it but having a specific product that that you can use is um, definitely a need um that you can't just go to PetSmart and by yeah 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 and again it was inspired by like the old school guys using bird feeders and certain mm -hmm. like they would do like they would like screw in a deli cup to the wall and they would work like that and i was like all right cool these are working for you guys but let's make it easier something you can take out and clean sanitize put back in and stuff like that so that was and the, it really it really started because i wanted to find out a way to feed what really sprung the idea was i wanted to find a way to feed crickets because it's impossible to feed crickets to, to Mars because you throw a bunch of crickets in there and then the crickets go everywhere and they're lost. You have no idea of the animals eating the crickets. So when I found out that the crickets couldn't jump out of a tall deli cup, that's what led me to make that product. Because I can put the crickets in a tall deli cup, the animals could see it, they could eat the crickets, and not all 100 will escape and they will eat them as they want it, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah. 
And it's probably like a natural feeding response for them where they're they're going into like a, a crevice or like a hole in a tree or something and pulling. Probably, it. yeah. Yeah. Well, that That's reminds cool. me too of Skyler, Hail the Scales. We're in a group chat with him and he he posted a video in the group chat. I guess it was last week. He's got a, a yellow tree monitor that he just got. And and she was chasing around a cricket and it like went into a, a cork bar yeah. and like hollow. Yeah, and she was like so using her crawl to like dig out of that man. It's so cool. I love yeah. those kind yeah. of behaviors that we get. If you just if you set the animal up right, how they're supposed to be set up, you get so many more behaviors that you're never gonna get in these like simplistic, easy setups. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's true, man. It's true. And it just takes you wanting to do it, you know. Just give it yeah. a try. Like you guys said, try it out, see if it works for you. Don't say it doesn't work because you haven't tried it yet, yet you know. Yeah. Absolutely. What um what kind of equipment do you have on these enclosures? Like we already talked through lighting and stuff like that, but like, do you do you run an automatic mister? Or are you hand misting everything? Um, do you do you do any like sort of UVB lighting or anything else like that? Or yeah, yeah, of course, thing? man. Yeah. So each, each enclosure has its own uh, uh, a misting. It has a it, it's okay. a, a central misting system. Each one has. I, I want to say. Four, five, six, seven, like between six to eight heads each enclosure has of a mist wow. of, of misting systems inside of here. Wow. Um, and I miss I used to miss like six times a day for like like 30 to 30 seconds to a minute. Now I miss one time a day. I miss for like three minutes out of the day, like continuous mist. Uh, so that they get a long time to drink and then it's dry for the rest of the day because, and I changed that after I came back from my trip, it's just what I experienced. And I thought it made more sense. Mm -hmm. And it does. Cause they drink, they drink the entire time that it, 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 it missed. They drink. Um, I don't have any uh, thermostats because for monitors, I found that it's just so unpredictable because the monitor could sit on the, 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 the probe and change the, the temperature or, because my basking is so different and each cage is different, it would just be so impossible yeah. to monitor that stuff. So I have a temp gun that I'm checking almost daily or every other day to see what the temperatures are so I can adjust them. And mm -hmm. everything, everything I'll show you, everything is uh, plugged up on my phone. Um, so I'm able to like, I'm able to, what cage is this behind? Yeah, I'm able to like go ahead and like turn off and on. I can, uh, I could turn my cages on and off with my phone and stuff like that. You can see, awesome. so yeah. So that's so that that that's what I do and everything like that with that. So with that, I can dim my lights or or make them hotter, really? make them colder. Yeah, with this, yeah. This so this even has like this app has a this app has a uh, uh, um, it's really I'll show you right now. Like this is yeah. this is number four. Um, look, see, see how wow. I, I, can okay. yeah. I can raise it. Yeah. So. The, yeah, so so the way the way I do this is I I will uh, I will uh, my lights my lights turn on first these guys turn on the the heat lamps turn on from a, a zero percent all the way to a hundred percent in an hour increment and once these are on in an hour then the UVB and the LED lights turn on so it's almost That's like a surprise insane. sundown that that happens every day for every single one of these enclosures right and yeah. that's me trying to mimic how it would happen naturally and everything. So they're just like blasted with an instant yeah. light. So each one is controlled that way. And that, and, and so I temp gun so I can see where it needs to be adjusted where, and I set it up like that. Each enclosure has UVB, one UVB strip, uh, and then two LED strips on top of that, two full yeah. spectrum LED strips for plant growth and just general lighting and everything like that inside of there. So there's a lot of, a lot of stuff that I added. It, yeah. Is it excessive? Maybe, but I just feel like, why not give it to them? You know, that, they, yeah, that's amazing. I, Brennan and I have both been chasing that feature that you've just talked about. So I need to know what app that is and what what the products <laughs> are to do that. I got you, man. I get I get them off of Amazon. It's like a it's a, a smart uh, it's an outdoor smart uh, switch plug thing. I'll, I'll send it to you guys, and and so you guys can put in the chat so people yeah. can use it. But yeah, yeah, it works out for me fine. It's able yeah. to it's in it and the biggest thing is that it, it can put the power load for all of these cages. So like one of them, each strip controls an entire cage pretty much. Okay. Oh, and so wow. each each cage is individually controlled. That's amazing. Yeah. I, I so I've got all the like 
I've got the smart plugs and stuff, but it's just an on off feature. So it's not like a, oh. you know, it's not like a dimming or anything like that. So when you said dimming, I was like, whoa, that yeah. is <laughs> <laughs> that's awesome. Okay. Yeah. I'll definitely get that from you and then we'll put it in the, uh, the show notes down below for anyone who's interested in that. Cause that's amazing. That's like that Arcadia just came out with that luminize fixture. Yeah. Which, yeah. I saw that. Yeah. yeah. I was like, Oh, that's cool. I've been doing that for like a yeah, year. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You're like, oh, I've been doing it. Yeah. That's amazing. Yeah. I'm glad people are doing it though, because it is like, I'm sure an animal waking up in the morning is just like, Oh shit. Like all of a sudden it's like midday, you know? So yeah, exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. I wanted to do it. So it's a little bit more natural for them. And yeah. even the, the off switch, when it turns off the led lights, the brighter lights turn off first. And then, the other the lamps go down at a gradual as well, so that you can go sleep as you would normally and things like that. You know, so That's and awesome. these are really cool. You can program them to do an hour start, two hour start, three hour start, however you want to prolong yeah. your day. You know, it's really cool. That's awesome. Dude, you just blew my mind right there. I didn't even know that you could do that outside of Arcadia. I'm switching so. everything over. Yeah, yeah. 100%. I'm going all that. But it's been way too much money. <laughs> um, what uh what LEDs do you use? Are they just Amazon ones? Or are you using like a specific brand? No, or anything? I, I went to Home Depot and I went to get, uh, it's a, I forget what the number, but it was a really high intensity. It's for plant growth. Okay. But, it, but I also, but I made sure that it wasn't too harmful for the reptiles by, I'm on that forum, the advanced reptile lighting yeah. forum and everything like yeah. that. So, so I made sure that everything that I was getting was particular to that. And I forget which 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 lamp I got because I got them over like a year ago, you know. Gotcha. But it's yeah. two it's two strips to them. They are full spectrum. They have the entire uh, uh, spectrum of of blue, red, white lights, and everything yeah. like that in there. Um, and if anything, they add an extra added light for the animal, mm -hmm. so it's not too dark in the enclosure on top of the UVB. And and the plants love it, honestly. Yeah. So that's what I've been using it for. But it were it was in the plant section over there. It's not in, it's not like a reptile brand or anything like yeah. that. Yeah. Gotcha. Yeah. We both use a lot of those those grow lights to um yeah. light our cages. Cause I think there is value in just having regular full spectrum light as well. Like it helps them with their circadian rhythm and allows them to understand like daytime and get yeah. just a regular cycle too. So yeah, um, I can imagine that, yeah. That's awesome. Okay. And then are you using, do you know like what the, uh, the percentage UVB is or whatever? Um, like it's, what? it's Arcadia. And I want to say that it's, I, I've been switching over because at one point I was using the desert. I want to say it was like the 5% desert that I was using at one point, And now I'm using the jungle, the jungle version, which is like four. I think it's like the jungle version that I'm using is like the 14%. Because okay. it's a little bit of a lower percentage in the desert one, so I had to go a little bit higher. But because my enclosures, the basking spot that they generally are, is about 15 inches from the top. That's gotcha. what I went recommended. So I did their whole. I did Arcadia's whole. Yeah. Uh, uh, they're they have a whole like list of what you needed, what distance, and everything like that. So I did the one that would go from 15 because my first basking spot is 15 inches, and so I wanted to go from where that level would be at, and no more further for those guys, you know. Gotcha. But it's all arcade. All my UVB is Arcadia brand. Yeah, they're awesome, man. I yeah, love you them. can't go wrong with Arcadia, man. Yeah, we're, yeah. Brennan they, and they I have are, what you need. Yeah, wow. we're huge Arcadia fans. We're trying to get a sponsorship. I doubt that's going to happen. <laughs> <laughs> Arcadia, what's up? Hook my yeah. boys up. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. <laughs> that's amazing. Um, so yeah. I know you, you've kind of hinted at it once or twice, but this recent trip you just took, man, to see to see blue trees in the wild. Can you uh, tell us a little bit about that? It looked incredible, man. I would love to, man. That was <laughs> that was the, the my highlight of the entire year, man. And I had to go in so hush about it because I didn't want I, – my, my, I wish I could have took people with me, but I had to go so hush about it because I didn't want the trip to get – like stopped or anything like that because it wasn't easy getting out there unfortunately yeah. but um but it was 30 day expedition out there into wow. into Indonesia my first time ever being out of the country in that sense like outside mm -hmm. of like Puerto Rico I've been to Puerto Rico in the Dominican Republic never traveled farther than that and and so it was our first time in a, a foreign country by myself and man it was amazing it was uh we were three weeks um, on the actual ground, like looking for stuff in the jungles. Uh, and the rest of the time was just transport back and forth. 
no mm-hmm. time for leisure, no yeah. time to relax. It was just like, get up, go. We're filming, we're exploring, we're ex- you know doing all this crazy stuff. Um, and it was it was crazy, dude. Like I got to see some places that man, I people could only wish to yeah. see. Like I, one of the most memorable spot things that we did was we went to the middle of the Batanta Island and to this piece of land that this these people that we met owned that was had been in their families like generation for so long. Uh, and the, in this particular part that we went to, there was this like unvisited uh, 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 waterfall that they hadn't been to in like 10 years. And we went to go see the waterfall and, and it's been that long since they had seen it. Um, and it was, man, it was just so crazy. We were in this, we were in the middle of the jungle and these guys had coconut trees and mango trees and fruit trees growing in the middle of the jungle that their grandparents had pr- had planted years okay. ago so that they had food whenever they went to go visit this place. And it was just like, what, dude? And, and we were asking, like, when's the last time you've been here? Like, bro, it's been like 10 years, man. Like, we're just, my son hasn't seen it. Now he's seeing it for the first time. And I was like, bro, it was it yeah. was crazy, dude. Like, eating jungle fish. Fish, these guys are spearing. In the, like, it was, dude, it was, it was amazing. We got to see a handful of tree monitors. Uh, I'm from from what I understand, I'm the first person ever in the entire world to film that animal in 4K the way that I was able to film it from my from my documentary that I'm developing, uh, yeah. and I'm the first person to ever document the catchers catching the animals for the first time ever in the wild. I've never been seen before how they catch them. People have seen them, but no one's ever documented how they climb up the tree, catch them with a bamboo pole, bring them down one handed. Like, dude, it was it was amazing Th- that area. Wow, dude! I just uh, I get goosebumps talking about yeah. it. It was just so surreal, man. Honestly, that's a trip like like no like I'm sure very few people have ever done, especially the exact same way you've done it. Like that's amazing, man. I'm sure being out there, just feeling like no one else is gonna like appreciate or even understand like the feeling you're having being out there. It's yeah, that's insane. Yeah, yeah what- it was all rough in it, man. It was just us in a group of like. We took him, but some days it was three, some days it was six, and we would just everything on our backs, and we would just go and camp, and we would camp about like it would be three to five days at a time that we would camp in one spot in the middle of the jungle, or on the edge of a beach or something like that. Uh, but we weren't like in a tourist resort or anything yeah. like this. So, like we were just like we would go into the jungle, use up all our reserves that we need, go back to the village supply back up on like food, charge up batteries maybe for the day, go right back out and then start all over again. You know, and then we were investigating different spots because if we didn't find one here, we want to check out this spot to see what we can find in that spot. And we went up all the coast of, of the northern side of Batan to, to find tree monitors. And it was it was crazy, man. It really was. That's so how do you how do you facilitate a trip like that from from the because I my my goal is to go to Malaysia to see cat geckos in the wild eventually, and just like the thought of that is just like mind boggling to me. So how do you how do you facilitate a trip like that for so long, especially thirty days? Is that's an insane trip. Well, uh, it, you the you it, well it costs money, right? Obviously, you gotta have as money talks in these locations. Unfortunately, like these people are like they're just like. They're not the most prolific people with money, right? And so if you come in there and you can give them the idea of what you're doing and it's not like you're not coming as like a poacher that's trying to take animals from the wild, they're more than willing to help you if you can afford to do it. And luckily the Raha Ampa isn't a very expensive place once you're there, you know? So it was pretty pretty manageable while while I was doing it. I want to say that I spent for the logistics of everything for 30 days, I spent about three grand. That's what I spent in the logistics. That's like prepping food, prepping material, building camps, taking water, paying all the people involved every, all the different days, having someone, uh, you know, a porter who was helping us carry extra gear, et cetera, et cetera. Paying for the boat rides between different islands. Cause that's really every, just for, just for reference, every time you Island hop, so you go from like Batan to Sarong or or Sarong to Waisai, all these different islands. It's like a hundred dollars each way. Yeah. You know mm-hmm. that that is in fuel that you're spending. So, mm-hmm. uh, but 
starting off, man, I'll, I'll tell you, it wasn't easy, man. Like I, I, I took, it took me a year of actually planning before like chatting online before I was able to get out to the actual area and find someone willing to take me. Um, a lot of setbacks, man, because depending who you are and what community you are, some people don't want to see you go onto these places because they're mm-hmm. afraid that you being out there, you might discover something first or you might ruin their opportunities of getting out there, whatever excuses people want to make. But interesting, I had, I had planned to go out there in September to Batanta. I had everything booked out to go to Batanta in September. And word got out that I was going out. I was I, I, What had happened was I had posted a, a post online saying, hey, guys, I'm building a, a documentary about this experience. I want to go out here and I want to make this documentary. Do you guys want to help fund it? Uh, or can uh, asking for funding because I come from a documentary world and this is how you raise up capital yeah. to do something yeah. like this, right? Because it's expensive to take right. out this gear. And I'll talk about how much it costs in a minute. But I do this and that led to this whole outcry of the world. Like, oh, this guy's asking people to to pay for his vacation, to go out to Indonesia and this and that. And yeah. and then that got word to some, some people in Indonesia and somebody in, in wow. Europe found out that I was doing this. And then they... Can act, like stop contact because someone in Europe wow. found out that I was going and he was like, he's not a researcher. He shouldn't be doing this. And wow. they, they blackballed the trip. So I couldn't do the trip for an entire year for an entire six wow. months. I had to, I had to then scramble, go on, on Facebook, every place that I saw that was like raw on pot forum, travelers forum, this and that, whatever, whatever. I probably sent out a thousand messages to different people saying, Hey, do you know how to find this animal? I'm looking for this particular animal. I'm trying to do this trip. I'm trying to film this thing, whatever, whatever. Do you see this? Whatever, whatever. And luckily I I got put into the right place, but it's just, you have the due diligence of like finding people online, the community that's willing to do this. And the beautiful thing about the Raha Ampa is that there's such a big community for people that go out there looking for birds Mm -hmm. that they happen to run into these animals. And so it wasn't that, hard and as long as you know the places to look for these people it wasn't hard to find the people that can take you to do this and so i wouldn't if i want now with what i learned i feel as though i can go anywhere in the world and find the right person yeah, to yeah. find what i want to find you know because now yeah. i have the knowledge of how to look for these people yeah it's like you do it one time and you kind of got the recipe to do it but that's Pretty crazy much. that that somebody else was kind of nixed your whole trip man that's absurd like, yeah, you know, I'm not, I'm not going to say names or anything like yeah, that because yeah, yeah. it is it is what it is. But, you know, when you're dealing with a place that not a lot of people visit, you know, yeah. it's kind of like you don't want to, like, give out the secret spot, you know. So you don't want to yeah, yeah. blow up the spot so everyone goes to the spot. And I'm yeah. more like, bro, this is like everybody's spot. Let's help yeah. out everybody get to yeah. the spot. Like, if, if more people get to the spot, we can help the people that live at the spot, yeah, you know. Absolutely. Yeah, that's, that's, how, yeah. that's how I feel, you know. So. Yeah. So now, now with this information that I've gathered, now I have like a fixer uh, in the Rasha Ampat who can take me out and see anything that I want to see out there. And wow. he knows he knows everybody, and I, and and they introduced me to these people, and he's, we're like really good friends now, which is amazing. Wow. And yeah. and now with this information, I, I've already had people come up to me like, "Hey, I've seen your trip. Can you give me this information to do it?" And I've already passed it out. I already helped people. I got someone right now out there who's going to go wow. visit the Rasha Ampat, the blue. Literally, as we speak. He's on his way to Jakarta with some of the information that I helped him out to do, so that he's going to hopefully see the blue tree monitors in a in a couple in a in a week or so, you know, That's thanks amazing. to this information. So, but this yeah. is what I want, and it's because someone tried to stop me, and I'm like, nah, I'm going to help out the next person that wants to do this. Go see, as long as they don't got malintentions. Yeah, yeah. Why not, dude? Why not? Yeah. What's to stop e- that? You know. Yeah, yeah, ecotourism. I feel like is really good. Like generally, like I feel like it 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 goes. The money ends up going to the right place when when it's when you're doing it for the right reasons so i think well it helps the people out it helps the people out in that because like you know one thing i saw when i was out there is that like these people that live in these villages in the raha ampat they're not making money in their village there's no there's no tourism in their village there's no economy really other than what they get from the government right and what their families might give them or they might do the odd job in the mainland and bring that back and so yeah. when you do trips like this, me going out there and I gave, you know, I spent three thousand dollars. That's that money aside from my whatever I had to use for supplies. All that goes back to them and their families. That's yeah. that's an extra thousand, two thousand dollars that I've given for that community now 
to help yeah. them do whatever they need, make renovations to their home, maybe build a homestay, whatever it is that they're going to do with that money. That's how that helps. And yeah. the more people that come out there, that just helps them more because they don't have opportunities like that, you know? Yeah, yeah. absolutely. That's amazing. So, so um, it's, oh, go ahead. It's, go ahead. You know, it's for us in America, it's $3,000 for a lot of us isn't, I mean, it's a lot of money, but it's it's attainable for, for people like that. You know, you give them a thousand, two thousand dollars, and they've, you know, it could change their entire lives for for yeah, God knows man. how long. You know, you know, like for for the reference, the average pay that these guys are making a day is like twenty bucks that they're making right. a day in the equivalent yeah. of U.S. You know, so like that kind of money for them, that like you said, especially when you're living in a community where like to get work, they have to spend the equivalent of up to a hundred USA in fuel just to yeah. go to the place where they can get work. Yeah. You know, so that that type of stuff helps them out in a, in a number of ways. You know, so yeah. so now that's that's what I'm trying to do now. Going out there, doing this documentary, kind of like showing all parts of this this land and what's happening with the tree monitors and everything like that, and then helping people that want to go out there and, and kind of do something similar. You know, I'm not calling myself a researcher. I'm not a scientist. I'm not out here trying to to put my name on a new species or none of that. I'm just out here documenting what I see on these trips and then sharing it with the world and sharing the information I gather about how to get out there so that other people that want to do the same can do that. You know, there's a lot of animals out there other than blue tree monitors, a lot yeah. of cool animals out there. Other than blue oh tree yeah, monitors. absolutely. Yeah. So uh, Raja Ampat, that's, that's like Western Papua New Guinea, right? It's in Indonesia. Yeah. But it's like that's the area it is, right? Yeah, yeah. It's it's Western West Papua, and the Raja Ampat is the name of the collecting islands in this okay. specific chain. So they call it the Raja Ampat because it's a very famous, beautiful center for yeah. multiple things, from like diving. It's a very big diving space. There's yeah. also the uh, the birds of paradise that live in that land as well. Uh, and then the tree monitor islands, obviously, that are also encompass this area. But it is the west side of Papua New Guinea that the west side has been taken from Papua New Guinea and belongs to Indonesia. Gotcha. So did you, you flew into, I think you said Jakarta, right? Like what was, Jakarta, yeah. what was the flight time? Like where did you fly into? What were they, all the airports? Like, <laughs> oh, man, that was the worst. Bro. Yeah, that sure. was the worst. <laughs> So I flew out of New York City, and the yep. first flight was from New York City to Dubai. Um, wow. And that alone was like a 14-hour flight from here yeah. to Dubai. And then I had an eight-hour layover in Dubai. And so or I think it was maybe eight to five hours, something like that. And I slept the whole time. And then I flew into Jakarta. And from Dubai to Jakarta, that's a, that's a I think it's a nine-hour flight okay. from there to there. And then I had there, I had like a 10 hour layover. So I met, I met my, my, my guide in Jakarta. Okay. I met his fam, I met his family. We had dinner. Everything was cool. Just hanging out until it was our flight to leave together to, from Jakarta. And that same day that I flew into Jakarta, we flew to Sarong. Okay. Uh, and then from Sarong, uh, I took the same day that I flew into Sarong, I flew in at like six in the morning to Sarong. I took the first ferry out to uh, the next island, Waisai. And then from there, that was like a two hour boat ride. And then I took another hour boat ride to another island called Cree. So it was like, dude, it was like 35 hours of traveling nonstop yeah. until I got to a place that I could stop. You know, yeah. it was like ridiculous, bro. Like, <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm, I'm sure as soon as you were in Jakarta, like you were just amped at that point though, right? I was amped because I was like, I'm here. I'm here. Because like, yeah. you know, because the, the whole mess that had happened with the people stopping me, my biggest fear was I'm going to get to Jakarta and they're going to be like, you can't enter. We yeah, already right. got, we got a phone call on the phone. We don't want you to come into our country. <laughs> that was the, yeah. that was the biggest fear. And I was like, dude, I just, I'm going to kill somebody if you tell me I got to get on another 15 hour flight, you yeah. know, like, so that was my biggest fear. But once I was in Jakarta, I was like, bro, I'm here. Yeah. I'm yeah. here. It's hot as hell. I get to eat some food finally. I'm standing up. And then, yeah, that was, that was wild. Once we got to Sarong, though, and I like, I, Sarong was cool. Jakarta is a beautiful place. It's a real, really busy, very, it's this capital. So there's so much busy, busyness. There's uh, high rises everywhere. Uh, it's a big crazy you can get lost in that place so easily it's it's bigger than any it's more wilder than new york i'll tell you that like 10 times over wow. um 
yeah, it's, it's just it's just so many people walking, such tight, narrow corners, mopeds everywhere, traffic everywhere. It's a really wild, fun city. Yeah. Um, but in Sarong, it's more countryside, like smaller, slower. And then once you get to Raja Ampa, it's just that's just all beautiful, beautiful, untouched beaches, beautiful, untouched giant mountain ranges. It's crazy how much it changes when you go through these different places and stuff like that. That's amazing. So where where was the first place you found uh blue tree uh batanta was the first place so we we so after funny but after we go on to cree i was on cree for two days and then after i got on cree and the cree is an island opposite it's like it's about a, a an hour and a half boat ride from batanta on the north side um i had to catch another boat from cree to batanta to meet my guide that i flew in with from jakarta because he was prepping everything for the trip and then from there, we went from Batanta, the area I met him in, we went into the jungle. And it's in the jungle of Batanta that we were at. So, like, not too far from where I originally was. But we didn't find, I'll be honest with you, we didn't find tree monitors until, I would say, week, like, week one and a half. We didn't find tree monitors. Okay. Because what had happened was our original guides, going back to, like, the people that had made the phone call to stop my trip, well, these guys, the original guys that we were working with had worked with these people before. So they had gotten a phone call pretty much for like, we don't want to work with this guy because someone already told us not to work with him type of deal. And which was, which is, that was me. And then, so we had to, my guide had to like scramble to find whoever to help us out and find these tree monitors. And so he found these village people who said they knew tree monitors, but they just knew any lizard. They thought any lizard was a tree monitor. <laughs> so we go, and, and then that's how we go out to their to the middle of the Patanza to look for them in the jungle. We they took us on a crazy goose chase, walking <laughs> for miles to find the tree monitors because they thought they were there, and we ended up finding their old land with their family and all this other stuff. Uh, and then when we get out of the jungle, we're in there for an entire week. We get out of the jungle, then we get a phone call from the guys who are like, oh, you're serious. You're really out here. Let's we want to help you. Let's go. Let's go to nice. the chief tree monitors. And then they come and work with us for the rest of the time. And then we find tree nice. monitors immediately after that. And so, and those guys were really cool, man. Those guys were cool. They, I didn't, there was no animosity. I understood, man. It's yeah, politics or whatever the fuck it is, you know. But yeah. at the end of the day, we got to see tree monitors. We ended up seeing uh, five tree monitors total. Uh, I got to hold a croc monitor, a juvenile croc monitor as well wow. that was that someone had captured in the camp, um, and and a lot of different animals, man. So many different animals. We saw the two most deadliest snakes on the entire island, which was the uh, the popwin uh, death adder is what they told me it was, and then the other yeah. one was the 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 um, the popwin uh, small eyed snake or the white snake, and mm -hmm. it's a it's a it's it's crazy. It's it's literally an all white. It's all white, and I was just like, what the when I saw this, I was like, what the hell is this? Is I thought it was like a morph or something. And then yeah. I had read about it already, but I didn't know it was this white. You know, it was just a completely solid white snake. And the guys knew that this thing was dangerous. It bites you, you're dead. Like it was, <laughs> and we saw so many different gecko species and bird species. It's crazy, man. It was a really cool time. Really cool time. So I want you to walk us through this from the moment you first saw your first blue tree in the wild, man. How stoked were you? Bro, I was already, we had gone to this one location. We had already gone to like three different locations. And for whatever reason, we weren't able to find them, right? Mm -hmm. And so we're in this one location and we split up. It's one, two, three, four of us. And we split up. Everyone goes into their own direction, right? And I'm over here filming. I'm using my camera, trying to look at the camera, whatever, whatever. And then my guy tells me, he starts, we, to, we, the way we communicated was we will howl. We will howl like we would just say whatever, just howl real loud. And then someone will howl back at you. And then that's where you knew where to run to. And so my guy, who can, the only one who speaks English, starts howling at me. And then I howl back and I run. As soon as he starts howling, he's howling multiple times. I like, I got to run to him. It's either he's in danger or something else. So I run to him. And as soon as I go to him, he's like, shut the fuck up. And I'm like, OK. <laughs> <laughs> and he's like, and the guy's looking. And I'm like, what the fuck do you see? And he's like, it's right there. It's right there. I was like, what are you looking at, bro? I don't know. I can't understand him. And he's like, yo, there's one here. Just set your camera up. And so I have the camera. I'm setting it all up. And I'm like, and he sees it's right in front of me. I was like, bro, I don't know what the hell you're looking at. And then and I'm, I'm scanning. I'm scanning. I'm scanning. He's like, right there. And then I scan. I see something I'm like, whoa. And it was a fucking blue tree monitor. Just 
basking a female adult blue tree monitor basking on this log and that's the, the video that i post yeah. up with yeah. that i have up there and he's just basking and i'm just like bro i'm like yo i tell my phone like bro take my phone out take a video let's take a video of me taking the video and i'm just like bro we found one and i tell the, and i'm just like, i can't believe it and and he's like do you want to go catch it I was like don't fucking catch it don't fucking touch it just let me yeah. just let me film it like i don't yeah. care what it does just let me film it yeah. don't touch it and you know and i'm like Cause they wanted to go catch them. Like, don't tech. I I had this giant lens that allowed me the tree monitor for reference was forty feet away from us, okay. and I had a I had a lens that was able to zoom in close enough that I could get that tight shot. And he was like, "I can go catch." It. I was like, "Bro, I can see it right here. Don't worry. I have it in my screen. Leave it alone." And we catch it, and then um, we capture it in the video, and I just let it move away. I let it move away after that. And I was just like, bro. And I give this guy, I gave every single dude the biggest hug that I could. I was like, I can't believe it. You guys helped me see my dream. It was amazing. I can't believe we just captured that. We stood there for like 15 minutes recording the animal until it eventually disappeared. And it was just, dude, it was amazing. And then right after that, we kept seeing the more of them and they were all in the canopies. And I would just take my camera out and I was recording them moving along the canopy. And in that same time, after we saw we saw the first one. We saw two more in the canopies. And then the last one, the guy climbs up the tree with one hand and he catches one and brings it down for us That's to film crazy. it. And we film it, you know, taking it out, like him catching it, bringing it down. Then we put it out here and we display it and take pictures of videos and pictures of it. And then we let it go back into the wild. And everything like that. Wow. But I, I didn't want these guys taking anything. Yeah. I was like, bro, don't worry. I'll pay you whatever you want to pay me. I don't want. I don't want you taking anything out. I don't want to get caught with anything. Like, I'm not here to take out right. of this out of this land. I'm here just to film them. And, but, but I wanted to film how it was that he was catching them because they brought the bamboo. I didn't tell them bring the bamboo poles. They were bringing them because that's what they naturally do when they go yeah. look for these animals. Right. But to see this guy scale a, like a 40 foot, 50 foot tree with one hand with a giant, I want to say this is like a 12 foot pole that he has in one hand crazy. and he's scaling the tree and he pulls a tree. He, he, he catches a tree monitor, puts it in his hand somehow from the 12 feet, puts it in his hand and then climbs down the tree with one hand and he just displays it. There's, I put a video of it where he's like displaying it like this. I'm like, how are you not dead, bro? Like yeah. you just climbed. How did you not fall down from the tree? How did you do this with one hand? I'm just like, bro, it's, that was that was wild, man. That was such wow. a surreal experience, man. That's were you so were you concerned at any point that you weren't going to see them? Yeah, and I was prepared for that if that yeah. happened. Honestly, I was prepared. Um, we had found one village, and the, the village that we found the 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 crocodile monitor. Um, one guy had a blue tree monitor as well. That's yeah. what we believed him because the son had a blue tree monitor that he had as a pet. And I was like, and, and he just had his pet over there. And I was like, let me buy that. I was like, can I buy it from you? I wanted to buy it. And then we were going to take it to Batanta and release it. That was a plan. But he didn't want to sell it to me. He was trying to keep it as his pet. Uh, so I had gotten that footage. I had gotten a, the interview with the guy. I had gotten everything that I needed. And I was like, okay, if worse comes to worse, we got a tree monitor on camera. Yeah. Right? That that We came here to see one. We found one. Cool. If we don't see one, well, this is a crazy experience. And I'll just say, hey, man, we tried our best and we'll we'll figure out how to get out here next, another time, you know, but that, that was the plan. But but yeah, I was afraid that we weren't going to see it because it had gone so much time mm -hmm. into that. We were already on week two, you know, almost to the end of it. And we're and we finally see the last one. I'm like, dude, like, what the hell? Like, that took a long time to see these animals. But again, a lot of it was because we wasted time going to the middle of the jungle. Not that it was a waste of time. It's just we just didn't realize that that was going to happen, you know? Yeah. That's wild. Yeah. I can't even imagine like being out there, like having, I mean, that's a huge goal, right? Like that's a super secretive animal and, and flying all that way, spending all that money, spending all that time. I can't imagine like the stoke finally seeing one, like accomplishing a goal like that. That's gotta be, Bro. I mean, we, yeah. we all go herping like locally and go and find stuff and even just going and finding like a, target species like whatever it is you know like around here maybe you go looking for some sort of rattlesnake and you find it you know it but you the thing is the difference is is you could always go do that again you know the next weekend or whatever but i mean to go out there and spend all that time and money it's it's a limited experience you're not going to be able to do that yeah. all the time. accomplishing yeah. that's and insane i 
for the record, I told you guys that I spent three G's just on the logistical side, right? Yeah. That was just for the traveling. That didn't encompass like how much the plane tickets were to get out there. That didn't even encompass the gear that I brought. Yeah. Just in gear alone, I probably brought about like twenty to twenty-five thousand dollars worth of gear, wow. which is like camera, lenses, solar panels, batteries. My just one memory card is five hundred dollars for this camera. One memory <laughs> card, you know, like. So like yeah. that that just so because so we can get the 4K footage that we were trying yeah. to get for this, you know, like so we spent a lot of money, bro, a lot of money to wow. get out there just to see these animals uh, and, and record this documentary and everything like that. And it and again I, and I and I did it because like I'm very passionate on telling this story of what's happening, right? Yeah. Because because what's happening is is. You know, while we were out there, it took us so long to find these animals. And when I asked the guys, like, yo, what's happening? Why why is this such a problem? They're like, well, we're catching too many, man. They admitted that they're catching too many. When I was there, they said that right before I had gotten there, in a span of in a span of like four months, they had taken out within their village 250 animals. They had taken wow. out. You know, that was in within a span of four months that they had taken wow. out between. And then I asked them, how many catchers do you guys have that they know of, right? That they know of. So how many catchers do you have in your village? It's like in a village that they live in, over a hundred of these people are all catchers. That they go out and catch tree monitors. And then the million dollar question I asked them was like, so how much is this worth to you guys doing? Like how much are you getting paid every time you go catch one of these animals and you risk your life and you kill yourself? They're getting paid $15. 15 U.S. dollars for wow. one ocean water over there. So it, 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 that's the incentive that they need to go out there to catch 20 of these every week so they can pay themselves to get survived for like a month, you know, out there. And it's it's crazy. Wow. So so, so to, tell, to tell that story, that, that it, 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 to me, it was worth it, you know? Yeah. And, and one thing I led on to this earlier, but, man, we're flying there again. We're going out yeah. there. I'm not going to say when. But we're going out there in the in the next. Uh, I, no, you're very good. soon. Very soon. Yeah. Very soon. We're going back out there. Very very soon. <laughs> That's crazy. And I, I and you don't have to say, but I'm sure like when you were over there and you were spending your the money on logistics and paying these guys and stuff, like I'm sure they made more money off of that than they would have catching those lizards that you guys found. Well, hundred percent, hundred percent. And I and and we gave them. We we explained to them like, hey man, like. You guys don't need to be catching these lizards. You can be making this same much money if you bred them. Like I showed them what I was doing here. I was like, hey, yeah. man, you, if you breed these animals and let's say you sell those offspring, you know, you'll make more money than you would make from catching one of these adults. And you will and you will, you will protect what's out here in your forest. Or better yet, if you don't want to do that, keep taking people like me out here. Yeah. And you'll yeah. make just as much money doing the same thing, you know? Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I, yeah, I think driving that, that tourism and getting more people out there to go see them is a great way to to kind of combat that, you know. That's, That's what we're trying to do now. That's what I'm trying to do, helping people get out there and learning these routes and, le and meeting these people so they can make these trips to help these people out because to me that's important as well. Yeah. The more they're helped out, the more they feel like they can do something, the less motivated they are to go catch these animals potentially to extinction. You know? Yeah, yeah. Fifteen dollars is wild, man. That's wild. Fifteen dollars, and when you get one in here, it's three G's. Yeah, you easy. Know, it's crazy. Yeah. yeah, yeah. That's crazy. That's wild. I I would love to do a trip like that, man. One day for sure. Like that's that's a dream trip for sure. I, going out there and just doing any of that. Um, did you did you see any pythons while you were out there? I wish. But no, no, I didn't. Yeah. These guys, if they did see them, they wouldn't tell me because they were definitely afraid. They were so afraid of snakes. <laughs> they were just really? so afraid because the mentality for them is that like if you see a snake and you bit, you're dead. Yeah. So they try to they try to avoid every single one. There's just every single one you see a snake, they would jump like 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 it was it was out there to kill them, even though they didn't even want to do anything, you know? Yeah, yeah. That makes sense, especially when you got things that venomous and you don't have hospitals that like you know, you yeah. can go get treated for it. That's a wild thing. Yeah. My friends told me that they had friends that had died trekking yeah. in the jungle and then they get bit and you're in the middle of the jungle. What you're going to do, you know? Yeah. There's, there's no way out from that for sure. Yeah. 
that's that's I'm, I'd be afraid of snakes too, honestly, if I was in that situation. <laughs> What's going on, dude? Yeah. Back. Yeah, dude, this this tablet just kind of shit out on me, so I had to go on the phone. <laughs> You're good. Dude. You're good. Um, so Eddie, like to bring it back to to the captive stuff, like how what kind of like takeaways did you have from that trip? I'm sure it kind of opened your eyes to a lot of things, but like you can go through some of that. Yeah, man. Yeah, I, for me, the biggest thing that I took away from, and there's multiple points that I realized. Uh, some of it was the dieting, the diets that I saw for the animals out there. Like I never witnessed any of the animals eating. And hopefully this coming trip, I'll be able to, to document some of that. But what I did notice was out of all the insect species that I saw, or all the available food that would have been something that I would consider them to eat, the biggest thing that I saw was an enormous amount of, of, of skinks. There was, there was more skinks oh. on that island more than any other insect. And I saw grasshoppers, I saw stink insects at night, I saw beetles, I saw butterflies, the works. But what I saw more of than anything else were skinks. And I, I have this theory that because the animals are so, when we were finding these tree monitors, they were really up high, super high up in the canopy, right? And, 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 and these guys had to climb really high to go find these animals. And the only other animal that was climbing up that high other than them was the skinks, right? And so I had this idea that what if this is the diet that they're feeding on more so than the grasshoppers and all this other stuff? Because to me, it would be much easier if I was a lizard to eat another lizard on my tree than a, than a bug that can fly away as soon as it mm -hmm. sees me, you know? Yeah. Uh, so, so seeing that, I, 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 again, I, I haven't documented it. I don't know if it's true, but th that was the most common food availability that I saw there. Um, the second thing was the 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 watering, the, the how much water had come down. And I had went I went from January, I went from December 28th to January like 25th. I was out there, right? And uh, and I went during the monsoon season, which is supposed to be the monsoon season, so a pretty rainy season. And for me, it would rain. Every time we'd go to sleep after like one o'clock, it would rain till like three in the morning, four in the morning, it would stop. Uh, and then it would rain again around like 11 to maybe one o'clock for like an hour or two. And then it would stop and it was bright and sunny for the rest of the day. And yeah. it wasn't like continuous pouring all day. And so that when I came back home, that made me change up my miss schedule because I was misting like five, six times a day, continuously keeping it super wet. And what I realized out there, yeah, it was really humid and, and, and wet, but it was dry most of the time in most of the places that I was seeing the tree monitors. So that I changed that when I got here. And then the last thing was when we climbed, we climbed one of the most highest peaks on this particular island uh, in the Batanta area. And one thing that was really eye-opening was when you were down in the canopy, below the canopy, it's super hot, super humid. You're getting mm -hmm. like... You're sweating out. You're sweating out your mind. You're super muggy and everything like that. It's like probably like like 95 percent humidity underneath the canopy, right? But when we climbed up this ridge and we got to the actual tree line where the tree monitors were hanging out at, well, the humidity dropped like crazy, mm -hmm. and the breeze was significant. There was so much airflow, and it was much cooler in that area than it was below the canopy, which made me think, well. Maybe these animals, yeah, they are exposing themselves to high humidity, but the majority of their time they're staying in the more, more windier, more air movement, more airflow, less humidity spot. Am I doing this wrong? You know, with the humidity, am I putting is 95% humidity all the time too much for these animals? And they right. need less humidity during the day to breathe or what have you. And then, yeah, maybe at night they'll get that spike from that rain that they get. So, mm -hmm. so I changed some of that as well because of that. That's interesting. Yeah, it's like the, it's like you think about like microclimates, and I feel like a lot of people think about that like for ground dwelling species where they're going into like burrows and stuff like that. But I don't think a lot of people take into account like the difference when you go up higher and um, that changes. Well, who's climbing the trees, right? Yeah. Who's climbing right. a fifty foot tree? You're not. And the yeah. only way, the only reason I was exposed to that was because we happened to climb a really big mountain ridge that happened to go over the original tree line that we were at. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah. You know, and then that ridge had a new tree line, but I was still seeing the previous one. I was like, wow, it's a lot more cooler, a lot more windy, less humid up in these areas than it was when we started at the bottom. And that was that was really eye opening for sure, man. You know, interesting. Do you do you run any like computer fans or anything like that on your enclosures? No, not right now. But after doing that with the next enclosures that I build, the plan is to build an giant like like exhaust system yeah. that pulls air out and then one that pushes air in. You know, that's what yeah. I really want to focus next on is airflow to see how would that help out with the stagnant air that I have in here now. Mm -hmm. And work with the plants, with the animals, with everything that goes inside of there. You know, I'm, it has to help in some way, I would assume. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. That's that's really interesting. I got to run and grab a charger really quick, guys, but I'll be right back. You're good. Hell yeah, man. So cool. So I don't, I don't know what what I missed while I was while I was dealing with my internet issues, but. <laughs> no, I think I think we we're just talking about like the the the. The trappers, how they what they get paid. I don't. Did you hear how much they got paid and everything? Yeah, like you said it was like fifteen bucks a, a monitor or something, which is insane. Fifteen bucks a monitor. Yeah, it was wild. And then I talked about how I'm going back over there to the Raja Ampat. Did you hear mm -hmm. that part as well? No, I missed yeah, that I part. Oh, you missed that part? Yeah, I missed that part. Oh yeah, I'm going back out there. You know, like nice. I don't know if this part. I don't know if this part is going to get put into the docket into the into the the podcast or anything like that, but uh. But I'm going back out there for another 30 days. Um, I, I'm not. I can't say when because I don't want the whole world. Right. To know yeah. Right absolutely. <laughs> but, yeah. But but we're going to go out there for another 30 days in the next couple in the next very close months that are coming up. Um, mm -hmm. And then we're going to go one more back time in the winter time as well. So we're going to do awesome. two more times awesome. to collect some more data, to collect some more interviews, more footage, and everything like that for this documentary. Because there, there's so much that encompass this story, man. And I'm just I'm so excited for everything that's going on. You know, like. Oh, we yeah. got this in the okay. wild. We got we got babies here, freaking uh, uh, getting lit. We got little babies about to hatch soon. Like it's it's so much cool stuff, man. Yeah. Whenever this this part will probably we'll probably end up cutting this out. But as soon as Jack gets back, I do want to I want to touch on that before we end this. Those those eggs and stuff you got. Um, I want to ask you though. So they get you said they get paid fifteen dollars a monitor. Is that like a is that like their job? Is that like how they're making their money? Those guys, some of them, or, some yeah. of them, yeah, because they don't have no other work, you know. It's either they're like a lot of those dudes are going living out there and they're like providing food for their family, so they'll go trap like large boar there, mm -hmm. they'll go trap wild boar to give food for the family. And yeah. if they're not, then some of them are catching fish to sell to the local market. And if it's not fish, it's tree monitors, you wow. know. And, then, and, and I think it's because they get, I can't, I think $15 might be a lot for mm -hmm. them. I don't know, you know, maybe it's a day's worth of wage for one animal. So yeah. I think that's why they risk it. But yeah, that, that's the mean job for, for a lot of those dudes. I mean, he told me there was 100 trappers in their village. Wow. 100 guys that go out periodically to trap them. That's a lot of people, you know? Yeah, it is. Uh, Jack, he was just, he was catching me up on, on what I missed. So if you want to timestamp that and, and cut that part out, you can. We were just kind of, he was kind of catching me up on, on what went yeah. down there. No worries, no worries. Um. Yeah, man. So I was gonna, I was gonna ask you about those eggs you got. You said they're, they're, they're about to. You got some that may be hatching soon. Yeah, man. I can't wait, dude. I'm at one of uh, the my clutch. I'm at 141 days right now, oh, and they you're generally close, they, close. Yeah, they hatch at like 160, 170 in that realm. So I'm really mm -hmm. close, man. There's three really good looking eggs. Those things went from like the size of a tic tac to the size of a golf ball now. Wow. I'm excited, dude. I can't. I can't wait. It was crazy to see how big those things had gotten in size. But I'm. I'm so excited, man. And these are been my first tree monitors, my first ever animal that I've ever bred. Wow. Oh, really? Wow. These guys, you know? Yeah. What a first, man. Wow. Yeah, that's a hell of a <laughs> animal. <laughs> that's wild. So what? Uh, what do you plan on? On assuming babies hatch and they're healthy and everything, what do you plan on on housing the babies in? So I got a couple ideas that I have. So I have some uh, older style makeshift PVC cages that are like, they're like, um, I want to say like 24 by 24 by like 18 style caging that I have over here that I built fake rock walls for when I used to work with the black headed monitors that I just, I never threw those guys away. I was mm -hmm. planning on maybe working with that. Uh, I also built like a makeshift rack system with where I found these giant totes. 
Then I wanted to convert the totes into like individual cell enclosures for each animal mm -hmm. um, to keep them in there for just the rear up and then put them into like a four by whatever, whatever. But we'll, we'll see, you know, because the overall goal of like having the babies is I want to donate some of the babies as well, you know? Oh, wow. So my, yeah. my, my, my plan is like I'm already in talks with a couple of different institutions where I'm going to be giving one of these babies from this clutch wow. out to a zoo, you know, like the, oh. that's the plan. That's why I'm doing all this yeah. is for conservation to breed and then give those to zoological institutions so that they can set up their own future breeding programs and just keep this animal perpetually not going extinct pretty much. You know, they can learn how to take care of these animals, learn how to breed them. We can work together, et cetera. And kind of, it's just like help open that door for the private sector to the zoological sector so we can all hold hands and sing Kumbaya one day, you know? Yeah. Dude, you're the man. You are the man. <laughs> I love it, man. Yeah. Dude, you got me so hype on this stuff right now. It's insane. Dude, I, I, I appreciate it. you, man. But like, it's, 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 I, it's just how I feel like it's right, man. Like, you yeah. know, like if I, if I wanted to get rich off of animals, I would have worked with, I don't know, ball pythons or corn snakes or something, you know? Yeah. And like, I don't do, I've never made a dollar. I've been doing this for like four years. I've never made a dollar off of any of this stuff. Yeah. But I poured in a lot, you know, yeah. and, and, and I'm, I'm so passionate about these animals and, and what's happening to these animals and what's going on in this world that my, my ultimate goal is to hopefully inspire the next person that's passionate about whatever animal they're passionate mm -hmm. about and to go hard as hell, harder than I'm going. So they can inspire me to go harder, you know. That that's all I want to do, bro. You know, that's awesome. I think that's the dream for everyone is to work with zoos and like be able to to do that. And I think step number one, which you've already exemplified, is you got to have your own shit like top tier. You know, yeah, like, yeah, yeah. Like I'm sure zoos are much more willing to work with you and and be accepting of that when you've got you know the enclosures you have behind you and and the, the standard of care that you maintain. You know and mm -hmm. That's I think that's step number one, because I feel like that's yeah. a, people always talk about that, like, oh, you know, I'd love to work with a zoo one day because I mean, that's everyone's like little kid dream inside is to have their own zoo or whatever. And being able to work with the zoo is like the closest thing a lot of people will be able to get. So, um, yeah, 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 yeah. I mean, that's that, that's that's just what I'm hoping. I'm hoping yeah. that it, it works out in that sense. Like I said, I have I have one place that 100 percent if I want to give it to them, they'll take it. No problem from me, you know, so. Um, yeah. my, my, my ultimate goal is to get into these two very prestigious places. I don't want to put out names because I don't want people yeah, yeah, to mess that yeah. up or anything like that for me, you know, but, um, but, and I, and I, I and I'm going to manifest it. I know I will, yeah. you know, because like you said, when I've shown this to people that work in these places and they're like, bro, this is better than what we got, yeah. you know, and yeah. their facilities. And I'm like, yeah. let me help any way I can. It's free. I'm not going to charge you nothing. Just yeah. let me help because I care about this that much, you know? So. Yeah. We'll see, man. Hopefully, yeah. hopefully I can help. It's it's like one one tick in the in the in the window, and hopefully we'll shatter that window one day so we can open that to everybody. You know? Yeah, yeah. It's the same way as your trip, man. Like it, you just had to do it the first time, and now it's like a wide yeah. open world for you to go do again. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. That's awesome. Are you working with any of the stud books, or is that a goal or anything? Like to, to I haven't, man. I haven't, and unfortunately, it's because I don't work. I don't really get like I, I do this like a, a man. What's the best way to say it? I don't work with any other breeders really. You know, like I, I it's no offense to to breeders, no offense to nobody, but I have I have a very particular mindset, and my mindset isn't profit oriented. So mm -hmm. it's it, it it there becomes a conflict of interest when my animals are for one reason and another person's animals are for another reason. Yeah. It's just that 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 gets really mucky, you know, and that's why I have such a large collection and why I'm growing that collection. So I don't ever have to worry about other people's animals. I have the gene pool that I need to yeah. do my work, you know? Gotcha. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I would give if anybody asks for my information, I'm happy to include it there. If yeah. They want to see like who's the people that are in the U.S. working with these yeah. animals. I'm happy to give that information up. But in terms of like working with other people, I've done it in the past. I've been burnt by people in the past. I don't want to. I don't want to risk it. And then yeah. my collections are pretty close. Like this nutrient monitor, the, the, I would only accept that in that sense because it's come from like a really good friend, Brian Susan, who I know his 
facility is immaculate. Yeah. But before that, and then the black tree that they have that are both in quarantine areas, I have not let an animal into this place other than the turtle. And that went through quarantine for yeah. over three years. You know, it's been yeah. a sealed facility to not affect any of the stuff that I've been working on, you know? Yeah. That's the way you got to do it, especially when you're doing it at the level you are, you know? Yeah, because of one mite, and then I got to take apart every single cage that I have, man. And yeah. Like, man. I don't, I don't want to deal with that, dude. That'll be a headache and a half. <laughs> yeah. I just, I just went through that. Um, a couple of months ago and that was that was painful man that that's was just scary dude yeah that's just scary i don't know how i would have to throw away every log all this dirt oh yeah. my god dude i don't even yeah. want to think of that man that's, that's pretty much what i did man it was it was painful it was a terrible couple of months for sure <laughs> um avoiding that I'm, I'm pretty much at a closed collection now other than turtles but turtles are easier to quarantine because it's yeah yeah, yeah it's, for sure um that's awesome, man. Hell what, yeah. We didn't talk about the black tree. I know we're 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 rolling over two hours here, but I, I want to talk about the black tree. I didn't know you had a, a black tree. They're they're my favorite tree monitor. Um, for some reason, I don't know why. Yeah, but, we 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 added the, the black tree because it was a it was it just came out you know out of nowhere and it was like I was like man, I never had worked with these animals before. Yeah. you know, and 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 it, as much as I love the animal. I'm going to eventually let it go, unfortunately, just yeah. because like it, it, it was a beautiful idea to have a black tree and work with the species. But mm -hmm. then it opens the door to like, well, it takes away from what I'm doing here. Right. You know? And my, my my goal is to work with the blue tree monitors. Now I got to set up a whole different area for the black tree, maybe get another one. I can't mix the black trees with the blue trees because they're different right. genus and they might breed on the that just it just messes everything up. So yeah. as as beautiful as the idea, and I really wanted to be like, hey, I love this idea of a black tree monitor in my possession, in my group to work with it. It just takes away from everything else. So I don't think I'm gonna have it much longer, unfortunately. But it was a cool idea. It's cool. It's beautiful. She's there. She's fine. She's in quarantine. Yeah. Beautiful. The most prettiest black tree. And I got a lot. I'm not gonna lie, man. Blue trees are my freaking favorite. But after I saw this black tree girl, I was like, wow, dude, yeah. that is pretty, man. Like yeah. all black, like iridescent animals. I was like, wow, dude, that yeah. blew my mind. Yeah. But I'm just like, no, dude, I'm too, I'm too invested in the blues. Yeah. Man. I, I got to stay with that. How, how different are they, though? Like, are they a completely different animal or are they? Yeah, they are. They are completely different from what I see. So, like, the biggest thing that I notice about the black trees is that they have a more ridge ridge back so their neck the back of their neck is like higher bumps on it like more pointier bumps and it's more prominent than the than the blue trees i've never i've never seen that before in that sense the blue trees are way more stockier of an animal as well there's a, a, a little bit more hefty but the black tree is huge <laughs> easily as big as my biggest blue tree monitor easily really? and i didn't think that they were that big of a monitor yeah. but they're huge they're a big they're a big lizard, big, big lizard. Hmm. Um, but I would say that the black tree more friendlier than the blues. Okay. For some reason, every single blue that I've ever worked with has been a flighty animal. Like I can get it out. I have certain animals I can get out and they're good once you're out, but they're they're darting as soon as they see you type of animals where the black tree was just pretty much calm from the get-go, you know? Huh. And it's and it's a wild caught animal as well. So so it had been in it it'd been in captivity for two years. Mm -hmm. But it's just it was crazy to see that because I have animals that have been in captivity for longer than that that don't act like that. Yeah. Are they a separate like completely separate species or are they subspecies or a subspecies of Persinus, which is our, 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 our which is the entire gene like gene of tree monitors. Yeah. And so they're like it's the same as like blue tree monitor, which is Maraca or the green tree Persinus or uh or the black is Bakari, but they're all from just different islands. And gotcha. so for whatever reason, each one of these islands produces a different colored animal. And that's funny because I saw that as well when I was in Batanta, where even on Batanta, every region of Batanta we went, we saw a different color of the same animals. So like, <laughs> like for example, I, I made this video where I showed a blue-tailed gecko, a blue-tailed skink, or a Pacific blue-tailed skink. And in this one particular area, their tails are blue. Well, when we went deep into the jungle where I tell you we were we were by the waterfall, they were like a rainbow purple tail wow. instead of a blue tail. 
And then when we went more close to the beach, they were red tails instead of blue mm. tails. But That's the same so gold spot, the, the same gold line, the tails were just different. And I was like, this is this is crazy that they're so variable depending on where you're going. And I don't know if it's a diet. I don't know if it's just what they have available for sunlight or whatever it is. But it, it was crazy to see the, the variances in these animals. But in That's those cool. lands, every island has a different tree monitor color in, in the same way. Yeah. Hmm. That's super interesting to just think about, like, what the cause of that is. I just watched a documentary on um, – anoles where they were studying them in puerto rico and they were studying like the the crested anoles down there and they were looking at the ones in the cities versus the ones in the jungle oh, i saw this i saw this saw too that was cool. yeah yeah yeah, 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 yeah. It, was cool. <laughs> it was crazy so it wasn't even like I, I guess it was it was the surfaces that they were on and then it was like um yeah they could run faster on them and the the city geckos were way faster at everything you know that was crazy yeah. as hell man yeah, it was it was really interesting to watch, and I guess it was just because of the heat that in the city it's much hotter, so they their metabolism is faster, it causes them to grow more and stuff like that. But it's just interesting. You like it could be anything. It could be the temperature. It could be the diet. It could be the surroundings that they're you know evolving yeah. to fit into. It's it's really wild how like flexible their their genome is. I guess I don't know what the proper yeah, yeah, term would be, but. Um, that's amazing. Yeah, I really, I really want to investigate why the blues are blue, man, because it's yeah. it's such a rare color. You know, it's yeah. such a rare color, and you don't ever see that anywhere else. And what what makes this animal blue, but the other one is green, or or why are the black tree monitors all black? I, yeah. I'm assuming it has to be because they probably come from a colder region. But I don't know. I've okay. never I've never been there. You know, yeah. so I, I just I'm so curious as to all of this stuff. That is interesting. There was no like, I'm assuming not, but there was no like uh, colors like in the plants or anything out there that not you know? everything was green, man. Everything yeah. was green and it was all trees. Everything was a tree out there. Like there was yeah. hardly any brush that was growing. And if it was a brush, it was because it was going to turn into a tree eventually. Gotcha. You know? Interesting. Yeah, that's so weird. Yeah, blue is like a very rare color in, in animals. So I'm very curious. I can't wait for you to figure it out because I'm sure you will. Yeah, who knows? Maybe, hopefully, but we'll, we'll see. <laughs> when uh, when was that documentary coming out? So the plan is that I want to start producing the film by the end of the year. So okay. because because right. we got this first trip that we went on, we got the second trip in the summer, third trip in the in December as well, right? Or in that area, in like the winter time that we're gonna go, yeah. um, and then there's also the catching of the animals here that are hatching as well as the donation to the zoos that gets part of the movie as well. Then there's also a couple interviews with other people in the U S that are doing the same thing, breeding the animals for captivity. So there's a lot of parts, moving parts that encompasses. And then there's also, if the bill passes to make these guys on the endangered species list, that needs to get covered as well too. You know, yeah, so there's a true. lot of, there's a lot of parts of that that gets covered into this film. Yeah. Yeah. The, the Endangered Species Act is an interesting thing. I've got a couple of species of turtle that are on that um, and that I've been able to get just because, you know, I think the turtle community is great about this. They, you know, it's it's a lot less motivated by money. <clears throat> um, but, you know, people just send it. Like, I, I these were donations from the Turtle uh, turtle and Tortoise Preservation Group that they, they sent to me um, to oh, care for. Cool. Yeah, and they just want them spread out like in different states so that people can breed them within the state and you can sell them within the state. You just can't outside. Oh, but you can donate them. But you can yeah. donate them to people. That's that's funny because that's what the ruling is going to be. You can't interstate, you can overstate commerce is illegal, but interstate is fine. Yeah. And I didn't think of that part. Yeah. Wait, wow. which is okay. So it, it like I feel like it's it's not all bad. Like there there's a level of it. Like for you, you know, like a lot of what you're doing is is donating right so it probably right, won't right. as much but it's hard when it's so new into it um that like you know for blue tree monitors like there's not a ton of people breeding them so it's right, you know right, and, right. and then once you remove the monetary side of it there'll probably be less people breeding them so that's the yeah, yeah. A lot less. problem yeah yeah there's only like five people in the whole u.s that i know of that are breeding them you know yeah and and i heard that some of these guys say if it does happen, they're just going to stop breeding them, you know, so that, like mm -hmm. you said, so that does, it does make the line lower, you know, so we'll, we'll, we'll see what happens. I not even think, I didn't even realize that there's only like five people with these things, man. That's crazy. Yeah. 
Dude, there's yeah. so there's so many similarities between that and like the the Felinus, the cat geckos that I work with, man. Like just us talking about it, like with the you said there's like five people in the U.S. breeding them. It's pretty much the same with these guys. A lot of them are just wild caught, you know, and they don't do well because you know they come in a man, you know, just like dehydrated, skinny as hell. Yeah. And they don't they don't last long. So I'm. I'm slowly working my way kind of the same as you are. I want to really, you know, kind of solidify these in captivity as much as possible so we can not only stop taking so many from the wild, but, you know, if somebody wants one, they're getting a healthy captive born animal instead of dealing with wild caught because we all know how that goes sometimes. Dude, the difference in quality, like I've never owned a CB animal, right? All my animals started at wild caught. And mm -hmm. to tell you the difficulty that it was in some of these animals establishing them and yeah. getting them to eat regularly and feed regularly and not on the verge of death is crazy compared to that little baby that I got today. That little yeah. baby that I got was so alive, yeah. so ready, not huffing, didn't try to bite me or kill me. And it was a hit. And I was like, wow, dude, this is like I already knew. I obviously know the benefits of it, but I had never seen it presently. And that yeah. was eye-opening today night and day yeah night and day yeah always advocate to anybody if you mess with tree monitors get captive bread if you can i've done the the, the wild caught stuff and i tell you man you can get lucky but a lot of times you're gonna get so disappointed by that animal yeah yeah especially if it's your first one like yeah get ready get yeah. ready <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. I guess uh, that's a good thing to ask before we kind of wrap things up here is like if you have any advice or recommendations for people who are looking to get into to blue trees or any tree monitors that is like if if there's any first time advice that you would give to them and and what that would be. Yeah, yeah, I would say always if you get an animal, obviously do your due diligence as everyone has said this before, do your due diligence, figure out what the animal needs. Uh, there's a lot of communities online that you can talk to. Um, you can talk to all the tree monitor forums on Facebook. There are loads of people on there that are helpful in some ways. Um, and, 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 and reach out to other people that are working with the animals like myself, like Brian Susan, like Brandon from Canadian Cold Blood, if they have the time to talk to you. Ask some questions, man. We're always, though sometimes we're busy, we'll get to you eventually and help you out. And I'm an open book. I'll help out anybody that asks. But my biggest thing is if you get a wild caught animal, Make sure you're on top of hydration. Hydration is key. If you're doing wild caught, make sure you have misting in some form because those animals are only accustomed to drinking out of mist or, or dew drops or water that comes down from water. The biggest thing for those animals is hydration and getting them fed and making sure you take them to the vet to get checked. You know, a lot of people try not to take them to the vet, but if you can afford to buy a $1,500 wild caught lizard, you can afford $50 visit to the vet to get it checked yeah. out for worms and things like that. Just, just saying. Um, mm -hmm. And, but overall, if you can avoid wild caught, go captive bread. If you can, that's the biggest thing that I can reach out. And again, biggest takeaway, reach out to people, reach yeah. out to people right. working on these animals. Cause those are going to be your biggest help. And most of the time though, you might feel like you're a nuisance. I promise you, I've been there. Ask them many questions until you, you make our ears bleed because <laughs> that's the only way you're going to learn, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. And and the other thing I'll add to that is that you have you Eddie have done a ton of podcasts. Um oh, yeah. so definitely if you're looking into it, like go go listen to a bunch of podcasts because I've listened to a couple of them and it's it's a lot of good information. I feel like, you know, even just this podcast, you have been a wealth of knowledge and information. Yeah. Really appreciate, appreciate your time on that. But no, yeah, I appreciate all the other that. podcasts are great. So make sure you go check those out. So yeah. Brendan, do you have anything else? To, to ask Eddie before we, we kind of wrap these up? Uh, I don't have any questions, but I just want to say this before we begin the recording that, uh, dude, your your dedication to those animals is not only infectious, but it's so admirable, man. <laughs> yeah. Like, I've been I've been following your Instagram for, for a while now, and, dude, just like, just when you think, like, this man is, like, at a level, you just – you just you keep leveling up man and it's it's, <laughs> it's inspiring it really is it, it yeah. like you telling the story of papa dude i had goosebumps the whole time like, yeah, oh, yeah. Dude, you had me <laughs> you had me so stoked just yeah. to, to go and mess with my own stuff here and, and and try to make it all better man and 
I just I appreciate you coming on and, and talking to us, man. It's it's been awesome. Of course, man. Of course. I thank you for the chance, man. I, I love to get to nerd out. Like, yeah, I'm on Instagram and I talk to the people, the friends that have on Instagram. But when I get like live moments like this, it's like we're hanging out at a bar drinking a yeah. beer together almost. Yeah, you know, and that's, that's amazing. Like it just comes off naturally. And you guys get me excited because you get me reminiscing about things that happen. And I, I love it, man. And I can't wait for the next people to see this. And, and again, hopefully they get lit up and inspired too to want to do some crazy stuff that we all get inspired off of them doing, you know? So we'll see, man. I just, I love it. Thank you guys for the opportunity for this, man. Honestly. Yeah, of course, man. Thanks a lot. <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely. We'll, we'll have to, uh, we'll have to do a round two once that documentary yeah. comes out, man. Most definitely, man. Most definitely. There's going to be a lot of stuff that's going to happen by then. Yeah. Yeah. And the second round of cages that you were talking about, I definitely want to <laughs> yeah. touch base on those too. Absolutely. Awesome. Eddie, if you want to hang on for a second, we'll talk after this, but we'll wrap this up. Um, Everyone listening, we really appreciate you guys. Um, We'll have everything that we talked about in the show notes uh, below. We'll have Eddie's Instagram um, and a bunch of other links that he talked us through down there. Um, Just really appreciate you guys listening. Um, Brennan, do you have anything else to add before we we wrap it up? Uh, No, that's pretty much it. Um, Like always, if you guys want to, talk cages reptiles whatever uh hit me up on instagram i'm always down to chat i I pretty much live on instagram so i'll I'll get back to you pretty quickly and i'm always down to talk anything reptiles man so if you if you have any questions on things that i keep or cages or builds or whatever man hit me up down to chat but other than that man i got nothing yeah make sure you guys subscribe to the youtube channel too Uh, i think this podcast is great on spotify and everything else but if you can watch it um it's Mm -hmm. a it's better so um and we'll make sure we overlay some of those those videos that Eddie was talking about so viewing experience for sure so yeah with with that thank you guys very much and we'll see you next week see ya